Chasm, but the senator has to get out of here because he has some work to do on Capitol Hill. And so I want to just take the opportunity to start up a couple minutes late. First of all, let me welcome Senator Bob Corker to the American Enterprise Institute. Um, we're really happy to, to be putting together this morning of discussions about sustainable development. We're, we've worked with the, um, with the Consensus for Development Reform to put together what I think is a, a great group of panels a uh, great group of speakers. We've got the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee to open things up with us and talk about some of the issues. We've got the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee to close things up for us. So we really have a, an opportunity to have an important conversation. So yeah. welcome. Thanks. Good to be here. Thank you. So uh, let's get right down to it and talk about some of these issues. One of the things that has been central to um, the conversation about sustainable development has been the introduction of the idea that the private sector has a role. Right. That in fact, because in the past it really has not been considered an important engine for government intervention or, or encouragement. Um, and now I think that's started to change. But how do you see it from your perspective? Oh, well, I don't think there's any question. I think we uh, have not built upon uh, the private sector. Um, you know, other entities uh, around the world certainly have done that to their own good, but uh, obviously our focus in America is uh, is really trying to, to create stable, sustainable economies and countries, and and we have not utilized uh, that enough. That's why uh, you know we're focusing so heavily on Electrify Africa, where you really you really when you're when you're out producing these systems, you do it in a way that is sustainable. That um, there are tariffs. There is a way, and you do that through the private sector. That's why on food aid, um, you know, we'd like to see something very different than what is occurring right now. We can talk about that at greater length. And very importantly, uh, really building up, uh, you know more about this than me at this point just because of your long history of service, but really focusing on the economic component at the State Department. We're going to be inter introducing a bill this week. Um, to deal with trade promotion, to really focus that in an appropriate way, but to make sure that within these countries uh, trade can flourish. But uh, certainly the U.S. private sector is the strongest in the world. Uh, obviously the private sector exists uh, throughout the world, but uh, we're not utilizing it near enough. And uh, there is too much focus. I mean, we build, as you know, these constituent groups just sort of layer on top of each other. We do things the same old way. We waste. Uh, you know, billions of dollars every year with, uh, with, with the same outcomes, which really take us no place. It's, it's interesting that you talk about the same outcomes because it has been a mystery to, I think, many of us who watch uh, the, the aid process inside the U.S. government, but frankly elsewhere as well, that um, the truly the, the transformation of the world, the lifting of almost a billion people out of poverty, has been largely fueled not by aid programs or by handouts, but by globalization, by freedom of trade, by the lessening of regulations, by the free movement of people. And yet, there seems to be no connection between that and the bureaucratic machinery of the U.S. government. I uh, could not agree more. <laughs> so I want to hear a little bit about And, and it's though. interesting as I travel, uh, you know, I'm still learning, as you know. I'm a new person. I've been here eight and a half years and um, travel extensively around the world. And it's, it's amazing how our ambassadors in these countries, when you get them off by themselves, they will tell you, look, what we're doing is so ridiculous. And, you know, we should be focusing, you know, I'm making up a number, but 90% on economic issues and 10% on these other issues because, again, we're not, we're, not driving, we're not driving outcomes that are sustainable. I mean, we, we dole out monies. Um, obviously, there's some good that comes with that, but, again, it's not sustainable. Uh, tell me a little bit about the bill that you're introducing this week. So one of the things that, uh, you know, we, we've noticed it throughout government, there's over 20 trade programs that exist, no real focus uh, on outcomes, and yet we know, especially in some of the most impoverished countries, just the customs issues that they deal with, the lack of movement of goods, the ability for those goods to move appropriately uh, hurts their economy tremendously. And so instead, again, of, you know, it's consolidating many of these programs, really beefing up, uh, again, the economic component of the State Department itself, but trying to measure outcomes and really uh, sets up a pilot program to to enhance 
uh, some of these most impoverished countries' abilities to, to deal with trade, which again, you hit on your opening comments. I mean, that's how we lift people out of poverty. I mean, free enterprise has done more to alleviate poverty than anything else in the world, and yet if you think about the way we focus on that uh, uh, through USAID and the State Department, it's, it's not a great focus. So your, your bill would streamline the bureaucracy that's correct. Put. But it would also it would also use existing dollars, reprogram them to really show in these countries uh, with them just understanding ways of make, making it easier for, for goods to flow in and out of their countries, how it will enhance uh, their economy. You also talked about Electrify Africa. I'm, I'm yeah. interested because you, you, you seem to be sort of taking bites uh, of, of the challenge of reform. Yeah. And so it, what's, what's your thinking about Electrify Africa? Well, look, you know, you, you and I have talked about this numerous times. We, uh, you know, unfortunately haven't had a reauthorization of USAID since you were in the third grade. And we haven't had a State Department authorization since, uh, since 02. So to, to try to get at the whole enchilada, especially with some of the issues that we deal with in Congress today, is, is not going to happen anytime soon. On the other hand, you can reach consensus around certain items. And so, yes, Electrify Africa is one where we know the focus has been on, you know, building power generation, but there's been no focus on sustaining that, on building the distribution lines. On, you know, everybody wants to knock, talk about the number of megawatts that were created, but if you can't get it to people, then it does no good. So to make sure those distribution systems are in place, to make sure there are tariffs in place so that this will continue, I mean, those are the kind of things that stimulate. Uh, I know the title of this, I think, has something to do with entrepreneurial uh, abilities in these countries. But having electricity, obviously, is a basic issue. And so, again, instead of we are taking bites. I mean, our food aid programs are, are just grotesque. I mean, it is, you're talking about corporate welfare, and you're talking about something that would just make your blood boil. I mean, the fact that the maritime industry extorts our country, the fact that maritime industry causes people to be poor all around the world because we've got to ship things on U.S. flagged ships, by the way, that have nothing to do with our national defense, and in some cases are owned by foreign countries. I mean, it is grotesque. The fact that we ship commodities to, uh, to countries, U.S. commodities on these ships, costing huge amounts of money, distorting local markets, monetizing, I mean, keeping people, you know, we lower the price by shipping these commodities in, making it so that the people within their own countries don't have a sustainable system. This is ridiculous. It's, it's grotesque. I mean, it's hard to believe that we're sitting here and we haven't already reformed it, and yet you have these constituencies that, you know, work against it. So, again, Danny, to, you know, to focus in, in certain areas, to try to build some consensus and move ahead, probably is a better approach than writing sweeping legislation that, let's face it, uh, will never see the light of day or certainly never become law. And so, yes, we're excited about it. I mean, we have people here that have had tremendous experience uh, seeing how these programs don't work. Um, I think it is a blight on our nation that we don't see through these things more quickly and solve these problems that, you know, would would create sustainable economies, but importantly, less people would starve. Less people would be starving today if we could just pass sensible legislation along these lines. So, you know, that one we've got resistance, both maritime and ag. Uh, we're going to make some progress there. Uh, Electrify Africa will make tremendous progress. On trade, we're going to make tremendous progress. But yes, focusing on these niches, we've done some similar things with water. If you look at what we've done with PEPFAR, I mean, really, I mean, built tremendous capacity within these countries themselves to deal with uh, these issues. So, yes, I think the niche process, dealing with one issue at a time, is probably the best. We're, we're dealing with multiple issues, but focus on each issue with each piece of legislation is probably the best way to do it. Right. You want to win the battles one at a time. You know That's you can't right. win the war right now. Yeah. Uh, this is... 
fascinating. You know, one of the things we've seen this year, and I, I think a lot of people, even internally at AEI, come out in different places on the question of the XM Bank, whether it's corporate cronyism, whether it isn't. But one of the things that's been interesting to me is that something that has largely been operating for many years in the background without too much controversy has become a huge issue. Yeah. And when I hear you talking about the food aid issue, when I hear you talking about some of the trade questions, I just wonder whether it, there is an opportunity for those of us who actually care about outcomes, who care about freedom, who care about markets, and who understand the connection between those things and development and, and sustainable development, right. um, whether there's an opportunity for all of us to actually build uh, uh, the sense of outrage that, that you talked about yeah. behind this. Well, you can certainly build the sense of outrage, um, you know, uh, now lodging, you know, the commodities program away from ag. I mean, think about it. Um, it's the same amount of dollars. It's such a small percentage of, I mean, it's, it's minuscule relative to the ag industry within our country, um, it, but the amount of dollars would have massive good around the country. So if we had used those same dollars to instead buy these goods in local markets uh, and build something that, that works over time, uh, building significant capacity. As a matter of fact, we can't even get these commodities if you look at what's happening around the world right now. Look at Syria. How are we going to get U.S. commodities into Syria today? But the way the program is set up is we've got to use U.S. commodities. We've got to ship it over there on a, a flagship that, by the way, should be, you know, salvaged. I mean, these things aren't worth using. Uh, people are making a lot of money uh, off both shipping it there. And, you know, the, the ag committee, I mean, it has almost no effect on them, okay? But it's, 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 it's almost impossible today to get. So what we're doing is we're using dollars that otherwise could be utilized within uh, USAID because we cannot use those commodities, we have to use other dollars that uh, could be used in a much better way. So again, it's just, it's, it's, it's like mind boggling that we are where we are. But again, the constituencies are very strong. And um, you know, you know the, I mean, you know how committees work, and uh, we, we're working with really good people, okay? And I don't want to in any way this knock This the bill any. you have with Senator Coons, yes? Yes. Now, again, uh, of course, what he's dealing with, uh, you know, it doesn't affect, uh, doesn't affect us much down in Tennessee. We don't touch any shores, but, but uh, you know, you have the whole maritime industry and, and, uh, and the issues that he has to deal with with fellow colleagues on his side of the aisle that, uh, that, that have issues there. But we're going to make progress, and... Um, you know, progress is slow in Washington, but again, when you think about on the other end of this, uh, people are dying unnecessarily. Babies are starving unnecessarily because of ridiculous built-in constituencies here that take us, that, that really, um, that, I'll, I'll just stop there. I, I want to ask you a, a, a bit of a sort of a philosophical question about this large, about the larger war, if you want to call it that, if these are the, the battles, before I open it up yeah. to, to, to the audience for questions. But one of the things that, that is mysterious to me, having been in Washington now for many decades, is there is an understanding of the Department of State of the necessity of moving dollars around for policy reasons. You know, we give a lot of money to Jordan. We understand why. We give yeah. a lot of money to Egypt. We sell right. weaponry. We do all of these things. There is a certain vertical integration between our policy requirements and our and our financial assistance, our economic support funds, our FMF. Our right. uh, but but on the aid side, it, it's it it is still believed to be somehow dirty. Um, to try and connect the development assistance we provide with our principles, yeah. uh, free markets, entrepreneurship, and our policy requirements. We actually, you know, we, we're not going to see the outcomes because somehow it's wrong. Yeah. Uh, how, do we, how do we address this? Well, um, I, I mean, I, again, I think by building greater awareness around the fact that um, if you truly uh, want to cause I just an awareness, I guess, about the fallacy of the way we continue to do things. Again, you know this well. I, I don't want. I'm repeating myself. I know for the third time, but we end up having these constituencies that build up on the outside uh, that are hugely dependent upon these resources continuing to flow 
but making people aware of how wasteful over time this is and the real the real drive should be towards spending dollars to build the economic capacity within the countries themselves and again harnessing the tremendous power of the, of, of the private sector I think pointing out uh, some of the things I was just pointing out relative to food aid, I don't think most people in America understand that we literally are, you know, throwing billions of dollars in a mud puddle because we have people in our own country that are profiting off monies that otherwise would be feeding the poor. Now, I think the more you highlight that, and I try to do it at every forum as I am today, um, I think over time there, there, there's a, a guilt associated with that and people realize we've got to move in a very different direction. It's true you haven't been in Washington very long if you think that there's any guilt associated with any of these programs. So yeah. Why don't we open stuff up and, uh, and, uh, and ask folks to ask questions. If you would just be uh, nice enough to abide by our rules to uh, identify yourself, raise your hand, we'll send a, a young man over with a microphone, um, identify yourself and put your important personal statement in the form of a question. Um, <laughs> folks, or or I can keep asking questions yeah, till kingdom come if there are none. Apparently, that's what they wish. Yes, sir. Yeah. One sec. Well, uh, Mike is coming. Yep. My name is Mohammed Nimr, I'm at American University. I just want to ask the senator. Uh, talking about electrifying America and uh, Africa. Oh, Africa. Yeah. I'm sorry, Africa and. Uh, Opening up the uh, the, the the markets, yes. uh, loosening up uh, uh, trade, yeah. and then you link that up with uh, with stopping starvation. Yeah. Can you just trace the linkage between? How do you go from from electrification to uh, to stopping the, uh, yeah. the the starvation? So I think I think at the end of the day, um, you know, unless you have the basic elements that causes a society to function, it's very difficult to build the economic sustainability that is necessary there. I mean, you know, I, I think y'all know this, and certainly this will be an audience that probably knows this really well, but for a while U.S. policy was that uh, if we were going to produce any carbon whatsoever, we would rather people not have electricity. I'll think about that, okay? So we have 600 million people in Africa without electricity but for a while. Seriously, our U.S. policies relative to carbon meant that, oh, no, we're not going to use natural gas to cause people to have electricity. That would be because that produces carbon. So, you know, we've been able to shake that loose and move ahead in a productive way, but again, uh, electricity provides opportunities for entrepreneurs and others to do things within their own, which produces cash, which produces the ability for people to pay for, for uh, agricultural goods. Uh, our ability as a nation, which we're doing through Food for Peace, to, to develop people's cap capacity on the ground to produce uh, agriculture, to have irrigation to do those kind of things. All of that is closely linked together. That does not mean that I'm saying that we should end um, our delivery of food when there's famine or other places. I'm not saying that, but we should do it in a way that doesn't destroy markets in those, uh, in those countries. And we're doing that right now. I mean, the fact that we ship goods to a country and just because we have them and then we say to people, look, sell it on the market and whatever price you get, use that money to do the things that you need to do relative to age. Is that, I mean, think about how nutso our industries, as they should here in America, go when China dumps chips into the country, dumps tire products into the country, and yet we're doing exactly the same in these impoverished areas. So. To me, it's all very linked together. And again, you've got to have those basic elements there for an economy to flourish. Otherwise, uh, our aid programs are going to continue to be what they are. And they are, they're, they're going to be handouts, not giving people a hand up. And, and that's where we need to be focused. And look, more and more, again, our ambassadors, as you meet with them, they see this, they see the ridiculous, uh, nature of our efforts today and they know that at the end of the day it is the free enterprise system it's building economies it's building trade 
It's building self-reliance over time that is going to cause these economies and these countries to flourish. And by the way, that promotes the other values that we care about, democratic values, human rights, all of those kinds of things. But uh, that's not the emphasis. Not, there's not appropriate emphasis on that today in our country. And of course, you know, you talked about, you talked about the electrification and agriculture, but of course it, it links back to, to a lot of basic health issues that Africa's been contending with as well, whether it's refrigeration, it's water purification, it's so many of these other issues that are really yeah. just sort of basic human needs, so you don't have to swoop in and deal with diseases and, and, and the spread of, uh, you know, the spread of things like Ebola, which we sort of jump in and, and are astonished that these things spread so fast. I, I, we have a question in the audience, but I want to I want to ask you about something that you alluded to up front because um, I, I do think it was important, and I, I have a sense of what you might have meant, but I'm not positive. So other countries are in this business, and you sort of said other countries. Now the Chinese have a particular model for how they do yeah. business in countries in Africa, but also elsewhere. Uh, very focused, very purposeful, very oriented towards their national needs, That's not right. so much towards the others. Uh, talk a little bit about how you see that. Well, I mean, you know, they've got, you know, what, 1.4 billion people that have tremendous, you know, especially resource needs, right? And so they're building the capacity throughout the world to have those uh, for their own use. Um, and I will say that, you know, you go to Pakistan and you talk with them about uh, what we're doing aid-wise, and they'll say, you know, we, we, you know, like these little things that y'all are doing every year, but you know, look, China's building this this dam, or China's doing, you know, they're doing these huge impact uh, uh, types of projects within the country that builds obviously goodwill. So their look, their model is obviously uh, incredibly self-serving, right? Um, and and they are, at the same time, though, building some goodwill within these countries. Um, I don't think that's what our model is about. Our model is about really spreading values around the world that, uh, that uh, we believe make the world a better place. I mean, we have 4.5% of the world's population in America. We have 22% of the world's GDP, so we have an outsized benefit from global trade and a stable world, right? I mean, at the end of the day, people back in Tennessee, their standard of living is actually impacted by a secure world where we can do trade and send, send products from made in, the United, made in Tennessee around the world. Well, so, so our values are that we'd like to see the world stable. We'd like to see free enterprise. We'd like to see human rights. We'd like to see democracy. That's not what China is about, okay? So they go about it in a very different self-serving way. At the same time, they are building industries, companies, mining operations, other kinds of things in these building highways to get there uh, in these countries. Uh, and while it benefits them, it also benefits, uh, you know, the local economy. Although, you know, again, let's face it, it's all about extraction of those resources back to their own country. But again, you're, you are building economy. Our model, to me, is different than that, should be different than that, but we're not focused enough, in my opinion, again, on the economic component. And I really do think there needs to be a major transition, again, a piece at a time, but a major transition away from just doing the same things we've been doing year in and year out towards those things where we're driving an outcome uh, that is going to be a long-term outcome. Again, it's a different model. Ours is more altruistic, let's face it. Um, that's, that's what America is, you know, that uh, shining city on the hill. I mean, that's, that's who we are, and yet we're not really, we're not really you know, we, we talk about those values here within our own country, but we're not really carrying out those values around the world in the most appropriate way relative to the, to the aid that we're well, doing. Well, we're doing things that make us feel good about ourselves, but don't necessarily last. They, look, you know, at the end of the day, look, a philanthropist will tell you um, it's, 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 it's actually easier to make money than it is to give away money effectively, isn't it? It's very difficult to give away money effectively and to drive outcomes. When we meet with wealthy people and, you know, that's, it's a difficult issue. We're having that same problem with our own country. The problem is that um, 
once you start something, as you know, you have built up all these constituencies that are dependent upon it. And so, um, you know, and, and these constituencies, by the way, are based in states. People represent them, whether it's the ag community, the maritime community, and or others. And, uh, and, and change becomes, uh, it's, you know, there's more resistance to change. Absolutely. Yes, sir. sir. Uh, my name is Mitsuo Nakai. Uh, can you comment on TPP? Um, sure. Uh, this gentleman has no life. He actually comes and sits in our hearings sometimes. Oh, so uh, I want to thank you for that. <laughs> um, so um, I, I don't look. I'm a very much oriented towards free trade, and uh, as I mentioned, we like to to make sure that. In countries today that just lack sophistication, that they are able to embrace techniques um, that we have to enhance their own. Um, the whole concept of TPP is something that I've strongly embraced. Um, I look at the, the again. You look at what China's doing with their model. It's a it's a state-owned enterprise model, right? And that is becoming something that is more and more dominant uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, so we have the issue of, you know, trying to make sure that we have an effect on Southeast Asia that's very positive, that's very free enterprise oriented. Uh, but also, Canada, let's face it, just from the standpoint of uh, this shouldn't be the reason, this isn't the main reason, but from a security standpoint, it's very important that we, that we have this relationship. I have not seen I don't know any of the details about the agreement. Um, I know that Orrin Hatch, who's, y'all read all this, know all this, that was a major driver in getting TPA done, has concerns about some of the intellectual property issues. Uh, I know there are other parochial issues, but uh, again, we'll, we'll look at the agreement. Generally speaking, uh, transatlantic uh, and TPP, to me, the concept of those uh, are very, very important towards pushing some of the uh, uh, some of the ideals that we're talking about right here, but again, I don't, I don't know what the agreement says. I don't know whether we, you know, this administration did things that philosophically are just anti to the kind of things that we believe should exist. I just don't know those things yet. We'll find out soon enough. Yeah, gentlemen here. Thanks very much, Danielle, and, and Senator. This, I'm Steve O'Connell, Chief Economist of USAID, and thank you <laughs> very much for your support for us on cargo preferences, feed the future, and many, many issues uh, that are crucial if, to if us. If I could say this uh, just in response, but he might be getting ready to hit me hard on something. But <laughs> before he does, uh, it, what's, what's fascinating is that hardworking, committed people within the department see these things happening on a daily basis and it just drives them crazy in most cases. So anyway, Absolutely. Now, now hit me with whatever. <laughs> right, no, no, okay. I, okay. I'm going to come from the other side. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to underscore that, uh, that growth as the driver of extreme yeah. poverty reduction yeah. is really a bipartisan theme. Yeah. Uh, and it is the centerpiece of our new vision for ending extreme poverty. I brought yeah. copies. Yeah. Uh, this is, you mentioned the need to change thinking and to move issue at a time. Yeah. You also need a holistic framework, which you have in mind uh, for moving that forward. And that's what we've tried to do in this vision. And it really points to inclusive economic growth yeah. underpinned by effective governance and accountable institutions. Right. So very much the brand that you've articulated. Yeah. Um, right. To a, a question. My staff now. walked me through some of it yesterday, so thank you. It sure. does I'll, look very nice. I'll, I'll walk you, you further thank at you. any sure. point you'd like. Um, when you look at the geography of poverty and how it's changed over time, uh, two, two things come very, very clearly. One is that Sub-Saharan Africa is our frontier, and you've mentioned Power yeah. Africa and some of our initiatives there. And also, the other frontier, and this is my question, is the intersection between conflict and fragility in the world and the location of the, of the poor. Yeah. And so we need to be able to succeed in this formula in the toughest spots right. of the world. Uh, and I would just love to hear your thinking about that particular challenge. It's central to the national security strategy. Yeah. 
to the QDDR 2015, it's central to our own thinking, but it's a conundrum. Yeah. No, it is. And I mean, you're, you're stating the obvious. I mean, when there is instability, when there are security threats, um, it's almost impossible for uh, there to be economic growth. I mean, I mean, obviously that's, you know, we're having difficulties right now in eastern Ukraine. And, you know, look, let's face it. I mean, there's not investment taking place there because of what of the instability that Russia has created, which was kind of their goal. So, so uh, no, there's no question. And, you know, we, we talk often about the, you know, when I see a military person in the airport, um, I can't help but say thank you so much for your service. And yet, so many of the people that are on the front lines uh, are at USAID and the State Department in places that are very dangerous. And I don't think that we highlight that in the way that we should. They are great Americans too. They're doing things uh, uh, out of heart for other people, humanitarian assistance, trying to make people's lives better. And I don't think there's been enough focus on that. As it relates to the overall plans working together, um, I, I, I don't know there's much that I can add except to say certainly uh, security and poverty, uh, lack of security and poverty go hand in hand, and it's something that uh, needs to be coordinated. Our efforts need to be coordinated in, in, in a better way. Okay, but let, let me let me push back a little bit on this question. Uh, nice brochure, by the way. Um, uh, how do you get from the nice brochure that the U.S. government is increasingly enamored of to um, to the disconnect between the execution? And the and and that vision. Yeah. I mean, is the is the is the broken piece in there the Foreign Assistance Act? Is the broken piece in there the the interest groups that you've talked about? Uh, what? Uh, how do we how do we square that circle? I think again. Um, so the I'm not much of a brochure guy. Okay, I didn't. In my company, I don't think we ever had a brochure. We we just did. But. I do think it's fair to have an overarching vision about uh, in a statement of goals. I think when you have something as large uh, as these operations are and problems as large as we face around the world, unfortunately, I think what you have to do is you have to have building blocks and you have to show success in various areas. And I think we're going to be able to do that. And so when you, when you have a success, uh, uh, when 50 million more people in Africa have power, or you have a success where, I don't know, uh, Mali uh, ends up taking trade barriers down and flourishes, when you have those things, you can build upon it. So again, I, uh, obviously we'd all love to see, you know, take a wand and cause his brochure to be reality. Uh, it doesn't happen that way. And so we have to show successes. And I think success breeds success. Um, it's uh, it is frustrating. I mean, just uh, uh, look everything about everything about legislation typically is highly frustrating, but I th I feel some momentum around it, and I will go back and and not push back against this. I think it is bipartisan, and I think for that reason, uh, we're going to be able to do some things that over time are going to affect millions of people in a very positive way. As a matter of fact, I, I know that time's about out, and looks like maybe the hook is grabbing either you or me. But, you know, Danny, you know, we spend so much time in our, we're going to have a hearing today on North Korea. We spend so much time on issues that we should, ISIS, Iran nuclear issues, Syria, Ukraine, concern in the Baltics, the third airport being built in the South China Sea. And that's the thing that Americans are waking up and reading, and that's when I go back home. It's amazing, by the way. Uh, I mean, I'm a guy who built shopping centers around the country and owned real estate prior to being here in Washington, was the mayor of a city, um, and obviously have thrown myself into these issues and tried to understand them. It's amazing how foreign policy it now is an issue that everyone wants to ask you about and understand. But it's these areas that we're talking about right now that, you know, I don't know how long I'll be here. I mean, I've, I know that I have four falls left. Okay, I've got three years and four months left in my term. Who knows, you know, when my time here ends. But Danny, we think that this area that you're having this form about today 
is the place where, uh, you know, if I end up serving 12 years in the United States Senate and no more, we think that this is the place where we're going to have the opportunity to say that our service here was worthwhile because working with others, we were able to affect uh, millions of people in a positive way. You know, these other issues are very, I'm sorry, I mean, so what are we going to do today in Syria? It's very complex with, uh, you know, Russia and, and Iran stepping into the vacuum. But what can we do on these other issues, um, to me, and what will we do collectively? This is the place where I think, uh, together, uh, we as Americans can make a lot of difference in people's lives, and we're very committed to that. Well, I'm going to I'm going to have to ask that everybody forbear because I promised to get you out by 9:10, and I also want to end on that inspiring note. Thank you for your leadership on this issue. Thank you all. Uh, we're going to move to the next panel, so if you just be patient for a moment uh, as S Senator Corker leaves, okay. and we reset up the tables. Uh, thank you, okay. sir. Thank really. you.
Let's start in about 30 seconds, about a minute maybe. This uh, great panel we have for you. Uh, I don't think I've ever had a group settle that quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Either you're well behaved or I'm terrifying. Maybe, maybe it's a combination of both. Uh, I'm Jim Pethokoukis with the American Enterprise Institute, and this panel is the case for economic opportunity and the sustainable development goals. Uh, our panelists are, we'll go boom, 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 uh, Rob Mosbacher of the Consensus for Development Reform, Nancy Lee for the Millennium Challenge Corporation, and Juan Jose Dabu, uh, the former finance minister of El Salvador. Thanks a lot for uh, coming and uh, participating in our panel. Uh, I want to start off uh, with, a, uh, with a quote from uh, the new Nobel laureate, uh, Angus Deaton, from his book, The Great Escape, Health, Wealth, and the Origins of Inequality. And in it, he wrote, economic growth is the engine of the escape from poverty and material deprivation. The desire to escape is deeply ingrained and will not be easily frustrated. The means of escape are cumulative, Future escapees can stand on the shoulders of giants. People may block the tunnels behind them, but they cannot block the knowledge of how tunnels were dug, which is great economic growth. That's what we're here to talk about. Uh, perhaps the first uh, sustainable development agenda uh, may have been written by Adam Smith back in the, well, back in the seven, late 1700s, in which he wrote, little else is, is, requ is requisite to carry a state to the highest degree of opulence from the lowest barbarism, but peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of justice. So he had three development goals. Uh, the million development goals had eight. Uh, the sustainable development goals are 17 with 169 targets. And a, and, and a, uh, a rather critical piece in The Economist wrote, uh, the SDGs are still a mess. Every lobby group has pitched in for its own special interests. The targets include calls for sustainable tourism and global partnerships, for multi-stakeholder partnerships, whatever that means. Uh, they are, they're unfeasibly expensive. Um, at the moment, Western governments promise to provide much, uh, but give little. Uh, I think that is overly critical, because one difference, as we'll talk about today, in these goals and previous goals, is that they acknowledge the importance of economic growth. I believe it is goal number eight. Uh, is it six? Eight? No, eight. It is eight. Right. Uh, promote sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment, and decent work uh, for all. And let me start off, uh, each of you can take a, a swing at this, I'll start off with you, Nancy. Uh, that was, was there, was there, that was not a goal in the first millennium? How, how could economic growth not be a goal, if not perhaps the primary goal, when talking about economic development? So why was it not in the first one, and why did it change? Um. Well, I, I'm not sure um, what, what the thinking was um, for the first Millennium uh, Development Goals, but since the Millennium Challenge Corporation was in fact created at Monterey, um, and our singular mission is poverty reduction through growth, I think there was a clear understanding at that point of the importance, at least in the administration at that time, uh, carried through to the current administration, of the fundamental role growth pay, plays um, in poverty reduction. I think the evidence has only grown stronger over the intervening 10 years. What was evident for East Asia 10 years ago in terms of the relationship between growth and poverty reduction, uh, we now see in a whole array of regions that have experienced their own growth spurts, South Asia, Africa, Latin America. Um, so the evidence has only grown stronger that essentially what happens to reduce poverty is that labor income rises, and uh, that happens because the private sector is producing jobs and um, businesses. So, um, <clears throat> so the private sector, the, 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 the notion that the private sector is a fundamental partner in development, I think was embedded in the MCC and to... Uh, and in the minds of the founders of MCC, I think some of whom are here today. Probably. <clears throat> yeah, several things that I, I, I think most people know, but they bear repeating. One is 90% of the capital flows into the developing world are coming from the private sector. That means government folks play a 10% role. 
In this country, we try way too much to jam the 90% people into the 10% initiatives. We need to find ways we can piggyback on the 90% capital flow into the developing world. So economic development is an absolutely critical, indispensable component of any kind of progress towards the SDGs, in my judgment. Second, um, I think it's important to remember that we, notwithstanding all the cultural, religious, and other political differences we share around the world, everybody, everybody, aspires to put food on the table and a roof over their heads. And the only way you're going to get there in most places is with a job. And the only way you create jobs is to enable private sector investment, whether it's small or medium-sized businesses or even some corporates, but focus on job creation. So the SDGs are aspirational outcomes. We'd all love to have 7% economic growth. We'd all love to have zero youth unemployment. We'd love to have affordable, accessible, clean energy for the world. Those things are, are largely impossible, but how do you make progress? And that's to empower private sector players. And there are just a couple other elements I'll mention that I think are pretty critical to success or failure on this. One is, you know, you have to, leadership that's committed to investment, trade, understands job creation, understands regulatory burdens, is pretty darn important to progress. There are a few examples where countries have moved forward without leadership being so predisposed, but not many. Second, uh, a rule of law is helpful. It's an aspiration for many, but tax burdens and rule of law and regulatory burdens that can be reduced will facilitate a lot more job creation. Um, trade, there's such a clear correlation. OECD has done studies on this, others clear correlation between progress made by countries that are committed to open markets, free trade, competitive uh, trade policies uh, versus those who, who don't. And one last piece. I've, I've started a program called BizCorps where I recruit graduates of business schools to go work for a year in Kenya and Colombia helping SME entrepreneurs who have serious capacity issues, mostly human capital. My experience after three years is countries that invest in human capital through education, that's inclusive, that means girls and guys, uh, that invest in human capital who create a better educated workforce will make much quicker progress towards economic growth and opportunity than those that don't. All right. I, I, and I love the Smithian flavor of, what your, of your answers, love, love trade. Uh, Juan Jose. Well, I don't know why economic growth was not part of the first set of goals. But certainly, in the case of my country, El Salvador, uh, we knew that it was extremely important in order to be able to go from hardship to investment grade, which, which was a, a good part of our history in the case of El Salvador. Uh, I come from a country where, between 1978 and 1992, 5% of its population was killed uh, due to the army invasion that we had from communists who wanted to take over. 22% of the population migrated primarily to the United States. Our credibility was zero. That means no access to financing. Uh, aid was um, not that much available. And uh, we have about 49% extreme poverty. We were able to turn things around precisely by focusing on removing the obstacles that have been mentioned. Uh, we started by stop blaming others from the problems that were ours. We open our economy. We, re, we, we change the, um, the role of the state from one of an orchestra director to one of a referee that will help uh, resolve conflicts among the different actors of society. Uh, we also decided to strengthen institutions, and we recognize that it was better to have an imperfect market than a perfect bureaucrat telling us what to do. The result of these changes were that uh, El Salvador achieved an investment grade rating after six years of reforms. Uh, and we have distributed an article from the Wall Street Journal of the year 2000 where you can see that El Salvador in the years 2000 and 2001 was able to pass Germany, South Korea, Chile, uh, and many other countries in several indicators, including the Index of Economic Freedom. That shows that when you remove obstacles for people to take destiny into their own hands, when you uh, actually let creativeness and, and innovation to play its role, you obtain 
very measurable results that ended up in our particular case reducing poverty from 49% to less than 19%. So we cut poverty in half. We grow twice as much. We reduce inflation from close to 30% to 3%. That's 10 times less. And remember, inflation is the worst tax you can impose on people. And we, we, we were able to do this because we uh, uh, knew that uh, it was not through handouts, but actually to creating opportunities that people was going to make it. Having said that, and there is a question of sustainability here, we lost track. And about nine years ago, there was a shift in the, in the line of thinking that we had brought since 1989 when the reforms started. And now we are back to square one. We are back to almost the same uh, perverse situation in terms of poverty, in terms of um, unemployment, and more importantly, in terms of insecurity and instability. Because uh, politicians started to fool around, putting back subsidies, uh, ex putting excessive regulation, 22 tax increases in the last few years. When I became a Minister of Finance, there were 110 different taxes. I reduced that to three. Well, today we are back to about 30 or 40, all kinds of different taxation. So my main point is that, A, economic growth is crucial. Private sector job creation is what makes a difference. And to start with, if you are talking about redistributing wealth, you first have to create it. And the way to create it is through uh, economic growth. Right. Uh, I mean, so there's now some agreement that economic <coughs> growth uh, is, is the, perhaps the key factor um, in international development. Mm -hmm. But how do you get that growth? I mean, there's different, there's different, there's different, there's different growth models. So let's say there's great, greater agreement. Just be, if, for no other reason than the tremendous examples of what we've seen in China, India, about the power of growth to lift hundreds of millions out of poverty. So then what? So then what? So then what is the right model? What are there? Are there competing models out there, or uh, how much convergence has there been on what is the the right growth model to be talking about and creating policies and institutions to support? I, I think we start with a challenge in that. Uh, there's a great lack of people who have operational business experience in most governments, including our own. So when we talk about economic development that's private sector driven, there are a lot of people saying those words, but they're ne not people that have ever worked in the private sector. So they're immediately challenged in terms of how do we do this? And, and there's a, uh, not only a nomenclature, there's a language, but there's also an appreciation of the time value of money. So. People in government often sort of want to embrace economic growth, but they don't know how to do it. So I think, I think and, and, and that's even worse in many other countries around, around the world. So I think to the extent that we can help provide guidance and playbooks, let me give you an example of the kind of guidance you could provide to somebody. So if you want to build power plants and you want to extend electricity to people, well, figure out what the private sector will invest in and, and enable the private sector to do it with a return. And then look at the things that private sector doesn't like to do because, frankly, they don't make any money on, and invest the limited dollars you have. So, and the MCC is doing this, and USTDA has done studies about this, <coughs> and so we ought to be spending public sector resources on transmission lines, not on building power plants in these countries. So, how do you provide that guidance to governments to understand where the limited public sector resources can be leveraged? Uh, and then private sector will do the investment in plant. So I think help with more people that have private sector common sense experience, uh, operationalize these policies, <coughs> and help identify where the private sector will invest if you give them an opportunity for a return and where the public sector resources are most critical. Right. You wanna... Uh, just to pick up on Rob's point, um, <clears throat> when the MCC comes into a country that's been selected by our board, the first thing we do is sit down with a country team and do a kind of deep dive into what, is, what are the most binding constraints on the country's growth. Is it access to finance? Is it human capital? Is it the microeconomic environment? Is it the macroeconomic environment? <clears throat> That's a very um, collaborative process, uh, which results in really a common understanding 
of where to put the focus in order to get the uh, maximum return, not only on our resources, but on the resources that the government is investing along with us. And then we, again, with the country team, <clears throat> start, and as we start thinking about particular projects, we do a, a calculations of economic rates of return of alternative projects in order to be able to compare um, the benefits versus the costs of a, a different set of activities. So, um, so this process of identifying the binding constraints and then going through some projects uh, and comparing costs and benefits is really a very different process than, than um, arriving in a country and saying, you know, you need to do these five reforms, and if you do these five reforms, we'll uh, provide you fin finance. It's much more of a process of coming to a common view on where to focus human resources and financial resources. Um, I mean, in, in, in essence, um, the MCC role is to help governments deliver for their citizens in really two broad ways. One is the investment climate um, that Rob and Juan Jose were talking about. And the other is helping governments deliver better services uh, to their populations. So this, and that is essentially governance. Governance is at the core of MCC activities. It's at the core of the, the MCC selection process because of course, our board only selects countries that pass our scorecard um, that really assesses countries' track record on governance. But it's also very much at the core of what we do once we are, once we enter a country. We help countries um, select the right expenditure priorities. We help countries uh, increase revenue in their tax systems, but also in key sectors like energy and power, uh, energy and uh, water and transport so that they're more sustainable. We help countries level the playing field when um, certain parts of the population, like women, are systematically excluded from making their contribution to growth. We help introduce better training models. So the idea is not simply what we invest, but it is, in fact, trying to promote systemic change so that governments perform better long after uh, we and other donors uh, departed. And we think that's a reasonable expectation. After all, we enter a country with a large volume of um, grant resources. And so it's not enough for us just to um, benefit uh, populations through building infrastructure. We need to leave something behind that helps governments perform better after. And already we've sort of touched on the theme of governance. I'm, I'm, I'm curious um, that, you're t that, so the, you know, the countries they have to pass a certain, they have to sort of, there's a certain filter and they have to have certain criteria. So once that happens, you go in. I mean, what, what is sort of the, the you know, sort of the, the, the range of responses you get from government? They're like, hey, those are all great ideas. We can't wait to jump on those to um, that's not really what we expected. Or, I mean, how much, how much pushback do you get? How much, is that, how much does that vary? Or how embracing are, are they of, the, of your ideas typically? It, it's, a, it's an important question. And in, in fact, um, the way MCC operates has evolved over time. Because when we began, you can imagine coming into a country with um, the prospect of hundreds of millions of dollars of grant money, um, elicits then, uh, in many cases, a wish list of uh, projects that, that governments are interested in funding, which is why um, we move to this analytical process, which really disciplines the whole discussion. Um, and so the discussion really becomes sitting down with the government and saying, what really are the, the, the things that are holding back growth? And what are the root causes that are resulting in those constraints to growth? So it's a very disciplined, logical process that then um, uh, helps us and the government converge on an, you know, a, common, a common set of uh, priorities. So um, when we talk about country ownership, which is another core attribute of the, of the MCC model, what we're talking about really is um, a lot of discussion with governments, but also with the private sector, because the private sector is also part of this, this conversation about constraints to growth, um, that uh, promotes a convergence of uh, views. Doesn't mean that there aren't some disagreements, you know, in the co context of that discussion, uh, where governments are pushing in one direction, and we aren't seeing the evidence that, that that's the best way to, to uh, promote resources. But I would say, 
at least in my experience, uniformly, by the end of that process, everybody is on the same page. And that, that sets up uh, a, a program which is, really is owned by the government. And then the next step is really for us to help the government set up a management team to manage ma those projects, because MCC projects are managed by the country itself. We have a very limited presence on the ground. And unless we have that partner that's capable of managing these projects, um, you know, we, we could have beautifully designed projects, but they would never happen. And I think you can see in our track record, we have been able to, to build very large infrastructure projects in five years with very high environmental standards and, and uh, high uh, construction standards. Um, and that's because we spent a lot of time helping the country build this project management capacity. Right. <coughs> Um, one has I want to ask you, um, uh, you know, infrastructure projects. Oftentimes, when we talk about development, that's sort of what people think about. Like, you know, how can we have development? There's, you know, we don't have you know, reliable electric power. We don't, we don't, we don't have roads. And but you know, to go beyond that, uh, it's one thing to sort of build build roads, build power plants, electrical grids. Um, but at least there's you know there's, there's designs to do that. You know, it's an it's an engine it's an engineering uh, issue. Uh, it's also a financing issue, but. Uh, but sort of building up a, you know, more organically a private sector, uh, building up, you know, an entrepreneurial climate, that to me seems like a, a, an incredibly important but also a very tough thing uh, uh, to do. So how, how do you even begin to go about that process, I, especially if, if the previous government, the, pre the economy as it currently exists, is a very top-down sort of command and control kind of economy? Yeah, so the simple answer is leadership, but I go to a question you asked a few minutes ago in terms of the different models mm -hmm. that might be out there. I continue to believe that there are basically two models, and you know, and people don't like to use some of these words, but there is capitalism and there is socialism. And people have somehow packaged it in different ways for political correctness or to impulse certain agendas, but at the end of the day, you either have a model that privileges people and put people at the center of the decision-making process, or you have a model where it is a top-down approach where governments decide what is best for people. And as I said before, it is much better to have an imperfect market than a perfect bureaucrat telling us what to do. And so, as a former managing director of the World Bank, I was responsible for 110 countries, all of Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and Latin America. And then the common thread among all of those countries is that politicians are always looking at the next election and not the next generation. And therefore, any reforms or any investments will be looked at as a short, where they want to see a short return on investment and not necessarily the real process of reforms, which tends to take about one generation. It takes about 25 to 30 years for a country like Chile to become Chile, to a country like Singapore, which 40 years ago was nothing but a place full of mosquitoes and whorehouses, <laughs> to become the, one of the most active economies in the world. And to consolidate that, you need the leadership to be able to consistently go through that process, which has to do with minimizing regulation and maximizing competition. It has to do with decentralizing the decision-making process. It has to do with fiscal responsibility. How can you... Uh, do the things that you want to do if you have debt that is higher than uh, what you can pay uh, or give an example to the private sector if government is uh, 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 you know, highly indebted and, and has basically compromised the future of an economy. Rule of law is extremely important. And one point that Nancy mentioned, I think that MCC uh, was created with the best intentions possible, and I was lucky to be invited as a Minister of Finance 10, 12 years ago when they were starting to, 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 to create that. I think that with time it has evolved not in the right direction. A lot of the metrics are stretched every time a decision is made. So it was born with good intentions, but like many bureaucracies, you create them with those good intentions, and sometimes they take life of their own. And, and I might be picking too much on the MCC, but just to say El Salvador was one of the first to be favored, to be recognized by the, the MCC together with Jordan and a few other countries. And two years ago, again, a second or a third compact. Uh, and a lot of the rule of law <coughs> and the aspects that are in the metrics that are very important, regrettably, my country did not comply with them yet. They wanted to push some money through the window. So 
I think it is important to recognize that there are two models, one that has worked and one that continues to fail. The one that has worked is the one where you put the individual at the center and you empower that person to take destiny into their own hands. And the one that has failed is the one where you are pushing and you are deciding for the individuals. Right. You want, you want to say something about that? <laughs> um, well, the, the, um, in terms of selection of countries, um, the, our board consistently over the 10 years has remained true to this notion of very clear selection criteria ruling justly, economic freedom, and investing in people. Um, so that whole scorecard approach, which after all, um, it's hard uh, sometimes for uh, a government with um, various kinds of policy interests and political um, concerns to confine itself to 20 indicators, uh, we have consistently used, and uh, certainly in the case of El Salvador in both, both cases. This process that I described in terms of getting to country ownership of the priorities is taking a lot of time. And, and I think um, that was the case um, in El Salvador. And so you have a little bit of a trade-off. If you really are serious about country ownership and you want to have the conversation and you want to bring in the private sector and civil society and come to a common view, it takes a long time. In addition to that, all this economic analysis that I was mentioning, the constraints analysis and the uh, calculation of economic returns and the project designed with high environmental and construction standards also takes a lot of time. So um, it, is, it is true that our compact development process uh, takes a while. Uh, we are working actually to try to, to figure out ways to um, accelerate that process and we just internally went through a whole compact development review process uh, aimed at um, you know uh, creating uh, a, a kind of consistent um, and as, as, as streamlined as possible process to move compacts forward. But the reality is that um, these objectives of country ownership of, uh, of project quality of you know embedding projects deeply in economic analysis um, uh, takes some time to do. And, um, and they very much determine the success of our compacts because our history has shown us that where we don't do those things, we're less successful um, in, in the outcomes of our. So learning from that experience is also part of the process. <clears throat> James, just add yep. one point. My, my experience is there are entrepreneurs all over the world. They just take different shapes. They may be uh, operating a business out of a booth or a stall, uh, but you know, if you travel and you go from the airport into the town, uh, you'll see entrepreneurs everywhere. These are mostly people who are just trying to put food on the table, but they, many of them have aspirations to go from that uh, stall to a, a store. And some countries are good at facilitating that, and some of them are just deaf to facilitating that. And the ones that make credit more affordable and available for SMEs uh, are the ones that are going to see more growth. The ones that, again, don't strangle you when you go to try to permit a business uh, are going to see that sort of growth. So I think uh, the potential is out there. The challenge of the SDGs is how do we maximize that potential for growth and, and yet make sure that we're, we're not just sort of uh, wide open space with, with no rules or no referees. So I think, I, I'm hopeful there are ways to do it, but uh, there aren't many countries that do it that well. Right, and I, I want to get how, I mean, what are the strategies to take that, that eighth goal about economic growth? And, and I think as we've talked about, making sure there's a very important private sector entrepreneurial component. Um, but it sort, of, sort of hit me. Um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the incredible development of China sort of made the general argument easier the fact that if you have much faster economic growth, it's going to lift every it's going to lift everybody up. Um, so that so that way, China is a great positive. But to me, it would also it's also a negative that China still is a very authoritarian country. It's still very top down. Still has a lot of state ownership, and then that some countries might look might see well that's the model exactly. It's not so they make sort of overlooked sort of the economic freedom component of the Chinese story and focus more on sort of the state directed component of the Chinese story. Um, this, so, so does China both sort of help and hinder when, when trying to persuade countries uh, about the right sort of, you know, kind of more economic freedom path to take? Well, I mean, I, I think uh, 
there are clear advantages to sort of moving people off farms into cities. It's, it's harsh, violates most people's view of private property ownership, but when you move people into centers of economic activity, they're going to benefit. They may go from a dollar a day to five dollars a day, but they're going to benefit. I think we're starting to see some of the limits of that, even in China, where, again, the environment has been uh, damaged immeasurably uh, through some of this, and uh, there are, are limitations to uh, the opportunities for, for jobs. So, uh, and, and the same thing goes for large parts of Africa. The mass migration into the cities has had benefits, but it's also had horrible, horrible challenges. And so infrastructure is overburdened. And, uh, and so, again, if you want to uh, look at a path towards sort of jobs that pay a decent wage, you're looking at a manufacturing base. Well, manufacturing bases in many of these countries simply will not exist or be competitive if they're paying 50 cents per kilowatt hour for electricity. Uh, that's where you kind of come back to uh, goal number seven, which is, you know, let's try to provide more energy. So um, I think the Chinese model had benefits of raising from a very low bar a lot of people into a slightly higher bar or level, but I think now they've reached some limits in terms of, of that uh, growth potential. And... Uh, and I think they're going to be challenged to see how do we begin to meet these aspirations and expectations of this sort of new middle class, not U.S. middle class, but uh, developing world middle class. Right. And I want, uh, wondering, I mean, from, from, from your perspective, uh, do these emerging countries, do they, do they see the sort of the limits of the sort of the Chinese model and they think, well, maybe, maybe the American model after all? Uh, is a better model, even though that requires government, you know, giving up more power. Obviously, that's the attractiveness of some countries that government still has a lot of power. So, sort of, which model is sort of a stand? Yes, we agree there should be economic growth. How to get it? So, which? And you were talking about, you know, two different models. So, which which model is sort of more in favor right now? So, which U.S. model are you talking about? Because <laughs> the U.S. is moving more towards the French model, <laughs> and, and 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 that's really a shame because we used to look at the U.S. as the, you know premier uh, uh, model in terms of allowing people to innovate and create a very open economy. China is a, a, a country that has a good level of economic freedom and not enough political freedom. And that has allowed for about one billion people to rise out of poverty, but you still have 400 million people. That's the equivalent to all of the Latin American uh, or more than the U.S. So there is still a big challenge there. And it is easier to ship something out of China to the U.S. than from within China. So there are still several challenges uh, that exist uh, in China. And therefore, I wouldn't say that's exactly the model uh, that, uh, uh, let's say, Brazil or South Africa or uh, Russia or India uh, uh, will follow or should follow. Uh, I think that I continue to believe that um, the model that privileges people and opens the economy further is the one that works the best, uh, as has been seen in after World War II in the cases of Japan and uh, South Korea, or more recently with Ireland, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Chile, and many other countries that have been able to to overcome the challenge, the challenges that they have. So. Uh, you know, again, uh, it was said before, uh, um, opening the economy, um, creating the environment for the private sector to create jobs is, 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 is the model that has proven to work a little bit better. And even in China, you know, in the last 30 years, when they started with the uh, free trade zones uh, 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 under Dao Xiaoping, uh, that produce a significant growth of, of their economy, and they are the leaders they, they, they currently are. Just to add one point, which is that um, one of the benefits of market democracies is that they tend to be flexible societies um, where political stability tends to strengthen over time, um, less brittle societies, so that um, the the economics and the politics are mutually supporting. Whereas if you, have an, uh, you, if you have a society where large segments of the populations don't believe that they have a voice in resource allocation, in policy determination, they tend to be more politically brittle societies. Um, 
which can lead to upheavals, which in turn um, have significant economic costs. So I would not underestimate the political stability benefit of, of um, market democracies. You know, you have the example of India, um, uh, which also uh, has been, you know, a rapidly growing economy, major reduction in poverty, major increase in the middle class. So uh, over the long term, you know, market democracies can be very messy, including the U.S., um, but uh, the political stability tends to be maintained, and that's very good for, for economic growth. <clears throat> uh, so creating, you mentioned creating an environment and ecology, you know, f so the private sector can thrive. Um, again, difficult, so what are some strategies um, that, that you can tell governments that the, this, 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 w this will work, this will help create more entrepreneurs of, of sort of all sizes? You may want to start with. Well, I mean, Again, conceptually, MCC was created to encourage governments to uh, sign up for certain reforms, which included investing in their people, but also trying to create uh, conducive economic environments. Um, the World Bank Doing Business Index, uh, which you know some people argue about how useful it's been, but if you rate people on how our countries on how they're doing, how hard it is to start a business, how hard it is to close a business, how hard it is to to adjudicate some claim or something. Uh, I saw lots of, of uh, foreign and, and treasury ministers who were quite proud of the progress they had made uh, going up this list of the doing business. So I think evaluating countries and giving them kind of a, a playbook or a menu of things they ought to do can have a very positive impact. Then I think we need to begin more, and this is what MCC was intended to do, but I think we need to do it broader, uh, reward investment and, and uh, investment in trade, investment in reducing barriers and, and encourage things, tie some of our own aid to countries that sign bilateral agreements with their treaties with the United States. Let's help them build a trade terminal in a port somewhere. Let's tie some of these things, and I know conditionality bothers some people, but I think we can encourage more right decisions on economic issues uh, and tie some of our aid to it instead of just providing budget support blindly to countries that just keep doing stupid things. Um, I, I just wanted to add to that that, you know, as we do these constraints analyses in, in a whole variety of countries, large and small countries in different in regions all over the world, there are certain things that keep coming up over and over again as the binding constraints on growth in answer to your question. Um, human capital skills comes up all of the time. Um, the policy and regulatory environment comes all up all the time. Often uh, uh, the use of land in agriculture and in, in industry and the constraints on the productive use of land comes up. Um, but also we see um, access to electricity, um, in some cases health. So um, those things that we've been talking about, if you actually do an analysis and you fit it to the circumstances of a particular economy, that's what you actually see um, uh, emerging as the binding constraint. The other thing is, and, and this is moving to the, um, to the trade uh, aspects of this, one of the directions we want to move um, in the MCC case is to start adding a regional lens to our uh, analysis. In other words, to try to harness the power of regional integration um, to actually accelerate growth and to increase the returns from our investment. Because it's pretty obvious to us that if we start thinking about power sectors and transport sectors on a regional basis, we can make investments that have greater economies of scale, greater returns, can, can drive uh, faster growth. And um, one of the things that we're, uh, one of the conversations we're having with Congress is to ask them to give us the authorization we need to make multi-country uh, investments to try to create this trade uh, and the benefits for, for growth and poverty reduction. <clears throat> so we're asking about the strategies. Uh, if you ask President Paul Kagame from Rwanda, he will say, don't bring to me development agencies, bring me CEOs of companies that want to invest in my country. And so one strategy has to do, or is closely linked to the leadership of a country. If your country is just raising hands, raise, putting their hand for a handout, then they will end. You provide those handouts uh, without any conditionality or without any 
real effort of making the right reforms, then uh, you, can, you create a perverse cycle. And that's one of the risks of the SDGs, that uh, there are no metrics, there is no accountability or responsibility, and there are no resources to do it. So I'll give you one example. Uh, on the issue, for example, of climate change, and I'm talking about the adaptation side of the equation. This has to do with food, water, energy, and coastal protection. So to avoid the debate as to whether something is happening or whether it is man-made or not, I think we need to look at the fact that today there are droughts, there are floodings, there are uh, vulnerable societies, uh, groups of society in many countries. In order to uh, bring so, uh, uh, developing countries to a higher level of resiliency, you need to invest about $100 billion per year for the next 25 years. That is not going to come from the UN, it's not gonna come from the World Bank, it's not gonna come from any particular government, and it's not gonna come through taxation. It is going to come from investments done from the private sector to have more efficient water irrigation systems, to build uh, houses uh, in, in a much better way with 50 centimeters higher, to use agricultural land in a more effective way because you have some value to the land. You actually price water appropriately and it's not wasted. So it is a combination of factors. And something that helps trigger those investments is to minimize country risk and sector risk. And in order to do that, you need to have the sort of right incentives in place, like uh, persuading the governments to uh, uh, increase their position in some of the rankings, in some of the metrics that are there, whether it is uh, the rating agencies uh, 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 ranking, whether it is the doing business report or the index of economic freedom or the world competitiveness indicator from the World Economic Forum, because that helps countries promote themselves as a place to go, as a place where that is open for business. So uh, talking about strategies, you need to have the right leadership in place. You have to have, in my view, the right philosophy, and that's one that actually embraces people's priorities and not government's priorities. And you need to have, uh, as I said earlier, the rule of law. You, re you really need to have a level of predictability where you can identify the risk and price those risks in order to make the investments that are necessary. You need to move from a state-owned enterprises to privately run companies, so privatization is something that needs to continue to be pursued, not as an end, but as a means to bring a more competitive uh, private sector. Uh, we're going to have questions in just a few minutes, so start thinking of any questions you might um, uh, want to ask. Uh, and one of the goals is it's not just economic growth, but sort of shared growth, shared prosperity. I mean, the issue of inequality um, is one that get, gets raised, I'm sure, in any forum like this. Uh, so. How do you create sort of the shared prosperity then and not just a growth uh, where all the fruits are going to go to a small sliver of the population? Well, <clears throat> again, I think, and this is, uh, everybody gets tired of hearing this, but it has to be sort of bottom-up growth. Uh, there has to be uh, an environment which is conducive to investment. And that means, that's not investment from uh, GE. That's investment from a guy that, or a gal that's operating uh, a T-shirt operation or, or some um, fabric shop. And so, I mean. But they would take GE too. Well, they, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. But I think you have to, again, look at individuals who are struggling uh, to make ends meet and, uh, and help them maximize their potential. And that comes from the bottom up. And that's where, uh, you know, there's so much growth that can be compelled, I mean, can be uh, supplied by, uh, by enabling that. Right. I think investing in human capital and creating an educated workforce uh, takes you to the next level. Technology offers wonderful benefits, but again, it's a slim uh, group that really can maximize the benefits of that uh, in terms of, of investment and, and business creation. There are lots of others that can be kind of pulled into that, right. but I think you have to uh, invest properly in human capital, that means education, uh, so that people do actually uh, have the basic competence to fill jobs. Well, just to take one aspect of your question, which is um, the participation of women in, in growth. Um, you know, in, in the developing world, um, there are some estimates that a third of the women and girls are uh, 
don't participate in the formal labor market. They, they're not in the formal labor market and they're not in school. So you essentially have a third of the female labor force that is really unable to contribute to um, economic growth. It's an enormous asset um, that's, that's not making the contribution. So focusing on uh, in every project, in every analysis, in the constraints to growth analysis, on uh, how women can participate in uh, solving whatever the, the problem that uh, we're addressing and uh, building um, whatever the infrastructure uh, project involves um, and benefiting from the infrastructure is a very cost eff efficient and effective thing to do. So um, again, that's embedded in the process. Uh, and I think MCC has sought to be a leader in, in incorporating gender considerations um, in its compact. And I, and I think, and, and in many of our countries, it's a very important issue. Women are uh, excluded from labor force participation and from entrepreneurial activities. It's exacting a huge cost on, on these societies. And we are finding that governments increasingly care about this issue. And the reason they care about this issue is not just for equity issues or for concerns about what happens inside families. It's because it's a, it's a, a drag on, uh, on growth. Um, we, we're just in the process of developing a compact for Morocco. The Moroccan government uh, sees the low labor force participation in women. They understand the importance of growth. And so they're very focused on working with us on education programs that can insert women into the labor force. <clears throat> I think Nancy is absolutely right uh, when we talk about inequality and when we talk about inclusiveness. To me, it has to be about equal access to opportunities. There shouldn't be any obstacle to anybody in society to be you know, an entrepreneur of whatever size. And what tends to happen is that the bigger the state, and the more excessive the regulation it is, only a certain group have access to getting the permit, not in 200 days, but maybe in 90 days, whereas the ones that are in a less privileged position have to go through all of the bureaucratic process, which has to do with a stamp that is put in the right hand of a piece of paper that nobody really knows what it's, what it's for. Because what tends to happen in government is that it is all about processes and not necessarily about results. So you need to minimize regulation, make a very simple tax system. Uh, we need to have uh, a very um, uh, a less discretionality regulatory entities where if in 20 days you don't give an answer or 10 days, it has to be interpreted as yes or no. And you have to uh, really have access to what was said before by Robert in terms of financing and education which are, are extremely important in order for entrepreneurs uh, uh, to, to actually succeed, survive, and grow. In most of our countries, uh, about more than 95%, some cases 99% of the economy uh, uh, is composed, is made up of the small and medium-sized enterprises, and about one third of them are uh, kind of in the illegal sector. Or they are not formalized. Uh, and, and the reason is not that they don't want to be formal, is that to be formal is so expensive and it takes so much time that uh, they prefer to stay under the shadow. So uh, that's another big obstacle uh, that needs to be removed. All of the red tape, all of the bureaucracy, uh, and to begin with, uh, you do not streamline or you don't make efficient the whole government. You first cut and eliminate what is not needed and only the parts that are left and that are needed are the ones you make efficient. Otherwise, you never progress, you never advance, because bureaucracies by themselves are always reinventing themselves to survive and to stay uh, uh, in place. You mentioned uh, government being process-oriented as opposed to results-oriented. So how do we know that these new goals in, in 15 years, we can look back and say these goals will be met, because some of them seem, again, extraordinarily ambitious. Uh, so, what, so what are the right metrics or, or standards to, 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 to gauge whether the progress over the next 15 years, um, is, whether you know, we, we've done the right things? Well, I don't think, uh, <clears throat> I don't think you can have uh, metrics that, that somehow <laughs> belie the basic story. So uh, the countries that, that advance economically, that broaden 
uh, the base and, and enable uh, employment and, and uh, investment, uh, trade at levels that, that raise the basic income of the country uh, will stand out and those who don't, it doesn't make any difference how they try and, and finesse the words of the SDGs, I think they're uh, failing to meet them. So I think it's just countries have to, have to take these, just like the Millennium Development Goals, and say, okay, these are the things we want to, uh, to achieve and uh, set about doing that. And, and again, I think there are a few examples where uh, people have stumbled into these without good leadership, but most of the time it's built around good leadership. In the absence of good leadership that's committed to these kind of goals, it's not going to happen. Um, we actually recently took a look at our scorecard as sort of a predictor of where, um, you know, whether, whether, whether our scorecard for qualifying for um, MCC compacts is actually a good predictor of performance. Um, and we, we looked at the question of whether the countries that passed our scorecard and um, were selected by our board not only grow relatively faster, but well, whether the bottom quintiles, the bottom income levels of those, um, those countries uh, grow faster uh, in order to uh, reduce poverty. So in other words, the question is, does our scorecard really predict countries in terms of their growth, and does it predict um, whether growth is inclusive and whether it's benefiting the uh, lower income? And we found, um, uh, we're, we're happy to report that there, that there is considerable evidence that those countries um, not only achieve growth, but it's, it's a inclusive growth that actually generates uh, poverty reduction. So I would say that um, looking at the kinds of things that are, are in our indicators are a, a good place to start if you're trying to assess um, uh, where to work and uh, which is there, countries is there, are... Is there any one or two indicators that seem to be more influential or really give you a good signal? Um, we, didn't, we didn't really break it down. Um, uh, you know, our, the indicators um, are, are, are a pretty good mix of, um, you know, investment in people and governance issues and political rights um, and economic freedom. Yeah. And uh, I think the, the results of this research suggest that taken together, they, they actually do a pretty good job in terms of predicting country performance. <clears throat> how, how do we know if these things are working? So again, I think Nancy has a very good point. Uh, there are some uh, uh, indices and metrics that already exist, and they tend to have a correlation of about 0.9 between them, whether you take the Index of Economic Freedom, the Doing Business Report, the World Governance Indicator, the Transparency International Indicator, uh, Michael Porter's Competitiveness Indicator. There are 40 that are out there. Uh, and the correlation among them is, is, is relatively big. And there is also a correlation with what the credit rating agencies do. So uh, not to oversimplify things, but again, economic growth, which is what we're talking about today, is one of those important metrics and indicators. Uh, and if you can uh, um, look at how the middle class in our countries, in developing countries, grow, uh, which is reflected in some of the metrics that I just described, I think you will have a pretty good sense as to whether you are achieving or not uh, the intended results of uh, some of the uh, uh, um, sustainable development goals. I think some of them are very ambitious. I said before that um, accountability and responsibility is going to be a big issue. Availability of resources, which are very constrained all around the world, is going to be a challenge. I put the example of the adaptation side of the equation to climate change. But again, I think to respond to your question, there are, I would follow or I would use those metrics that at least in the case of El Salvador, which I described before, help us to go from hardship to investment grade in a relatively short period of time. We cut poverty by half, we reduce inflation by 10 times, we reduce unemployment by half. So it shows a, a movement in the right direction and the metrics that we use are those that I described before. Great. Uh uh, we have a few questions. I'm not sure we have microphones we're going to pass around. Of course, of course, anyone who's been to more than one of these knows, and from the previous panel, speeches are not encouraged. <laughs> Brief, short, concise questions would be great. Um, directly right there. 
right, right ahead of me. Lucky you, you're in the front table. You get chosen first. Thank you and good morning. I'm Tim Docking. I'm with IBM Corporation, but an alum of MCC. Um, and I just want to point out, I think it's important to recall how controversial the MCC bumper sticker was when it first came out, <laughs> reducing poverty through growth. I mean, uh, I think that's widely accepted now as sort of um, religion almost. And uh, when you hear the people talking about the SDGs, there's really no pushback that the private sector has to be a part of the solution. It's not part of the problem anymore. Um, so uh, uh, I think uh, uh, congratulations, I think to MCC, congratulations to the vision for MCC. Um, but the question really is, is how, how is the private sector uh, brought to the table? Uh, not at the end when the report is written in a token manner, as, as we often say it, not as you know, one on a committee of 30 uh, uh, people who I think were sort of instrumental in the creation uh, of the SDGs. Um, how are they brought in in the process? And I think, Rob, you described a, a great example of how they, they could be brought into the process. How, how is that sort of model disseminated, I think, uh, not, not only in the United States, but in the international community, if we all are agreeing that the private sector has to be a part of the solution, uh, to achieve these goals and quickly, um, and can and how can uh, organizations like MCC, who have been, I think, involved in this for the longest perhaps, um, lead in this respect? I think MCC, in a way, is sort of searching for its mission over the next 10 years as a small development agency. Can the MCC step forward and, and lead? Can an American organization lead at a time when I think we all agree it's very important that not only is rhetoric uh, exercised that the private sector should be engaged, but mechanisms are provided and for ways that they, they can effectively engage. Take a swing at that, the first part. Um, yes, first of all, some of us that were involved, I, I was uh, president and CEO of OPIC for three and a half years, uh, were somewhat critical of MCC for not bringing the private sector in until you were practically landing the plane on the compact. <laughs> Uh, more recently, and, and I know there have been consistent efforts to bring, in, bring them in earlier, um, and that's really important. I don't think they're there yet in terms of MCC, and I know Nancy's got a perspective on this, but I think getting them in earlier is critically important. In terms of the broader conversation, uh, I'd even start with our country. I mean, I know when we try to kickstart investment in some fragile state or some post-conflict situation, we round up the usual corporate suspects, put them on an airplane and fly them over there and ask them, what can you do? That is not a good way to actually develop sustainable investment in a country. And so I think we need to build greater capacity uh, for partnerships with people in different sectors that are critical to development. That would be infrastructure and financial services and credit availability and things like that. Uh, so that we can call on, we, the, the U.S. government, can call on people in the private sector to help us draft a plan that's quick. <laughs> quick is almost an oxymoron, a government plan that's quick. But, but, you know, we need to be able to do that. We need to be a lot more nimble about it. And the MCC represents the best example, I think, of a government agency other than OPIC, which is an operational transactional agency that deals with the private sector. And earlier, the better, and it'll help spell success or failure on some of their compacts. Well, first, let me agree with Rob that um, uh, certainly over time, I think we've gotten more focused on the private sector. And I'll explain that a little bit. But I think there's a lot more that we could be doing. So I, I, I have to uh, agree with that. We, we view the private sector as a, as a uh, first of all, we consult with the private sector in this analytical phase that I described. And it's not unusual for the private sector to bring a unique perspective to things like the constraints on growth and, uh, and uh, analyzing projects. And it's not always the same as the government perspective. So it's very much valuable in terms of pointing us in the right direction. But once we start operating, um, I think we have a sort of multi-dimensional view of uh, the value of the private sector. Certainly, the private sector can expand the financing envelope. So crowding in the private sector uh, creates more resources for development. But that's not, that's not all. Um, I think we view the private sector as a partner uh, in bringing the right kinds of business models to our interventions 
you know, data-driven, evidence-driven, decision-making and resource allocation, uh, private sector innovation, certainly technological innovation, but also business model innovation on how to deliver services better and more efficiently. Um, the private sector is really critical on the question of sustainability and scale, because it's really the private sector, if we can do things in a uh, commercially viable way, that can take things beyond the, the scope of the, um, the you know, donor resources and even in some cases fiscal resources. So we want to think of the private sector in a very broad um, way, not simply um, mobilizing uh, finance. And I think OPIC is best placed in terms of its risk sharing tools for doing that. So what is our role really um, in terms of crowding in the private sector? Um, I think we can use our grant making capacity uh, systematically and strategically to solve some of the, uh, what some people call market failures that, that block private finance. These are information failures, their skill deficits, their institutional weaknesses, their policy failures. We need to focus very um, uh, strategically on investing our grants um, on the invest in the investment climate and um, in solving some of the problems that prevent the private sector from participating. One example is in infrastructure. Um, the sh any infrastructure investor will tell you there's a shortage of bankable projects in infrastructure. And so investing our uh, resources strategically on, in the sort of pre-investment phase on increasing that pipeline of uh, bankable projects and in, and working with TDA on these kinds of issues uh, is a very strategic investment and, uh, and, and will likely produce a huge leverage in terms of the ratio of our grant resources to the private sector. And I think um, we've started to do that in, in, in three of our recent compacts, one in Benin, one in Ghana, and one in um, Jordan. Um, we've, we've invested roughly a billion dollars and um, the, the private sector investment mobilized through that billion dollars is something, is, is nearly five billion dollars. So because we have these scarce grant resources, uh, we should be able to achieve uh, very significant leverage and I think um, the, the, the door is really open for us to do a lot more of that. <clears throat> yep, uh, another question. Uh, right back there. Yeah, Nancy, uh, first of all, I think the MCC is a welcome change. Um, to deliver U.S. foreign assistance more effectively. Could you, could you um, say who you represent? Uh, Glory Bell um, the I understand the website states that from that you do partnerships with uh, some of the poorest countries, but only those committed to do good governance and economic freedom. Given the tendency of elected leaders of changing the system so that their party or themselves stays in power indefinitely, besides Nicaragua, in which countries has the MCC terminated funding due to govern, um, poor governance issues? And what are the major signs you take into account to make such a decision? Um, our board uh, has made the determination to uh, terminate compacts uh, when countries um, uh, really depart from the trends that led us to select them in the first place, um, particularly in cases where there are political upheavals like coups, um, our board has, has taken action. So, um, and I think that's part of the credibility of the selection process. It doesn't only work in one direction. When countries perform, they're selected, but when countries regress uh, very visibly and very significantly, they're um, uh, uh, our board met, takes the decision. Um, other examples are in the wake of the, of the coup in Mali uh, a, a while back. Um, Madagascar, uh, did you? Did you, I, I, did you, I, I, you know, I'm, I, I don't have the, the list in front of me, but it's, it's a number of, um, of uh, instances, an, a non-trivial number of instances um, where the board has taken the de decision to, um, uh, to terminate based on, you know, concrete evidence that the country uh, is not performing. <clears throat> yep, another question? Uh, was there one? Uh, right there, at the, uh, yeah, the, uh, right there. Lady, the lady, hat. 
Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Kula. I'm a student at the American University. I'm um, very good panel. Um, thank you very much for a very insightful conversation this morning. But my question has to do with um, your basically highlighted some of the challenges for developing countries um, accessing or possibility of attaining growth by 2030. Um, but um, I would appreciate if you can talk about some of those structural barriers, for example, um, the World Trade Organization, the IMF, um, and the World Bank uh, policies that prevent um, these countries and put them in a bracket of um, dependency and you know going back and forth in the cycle and looking at the structures within the countries and, and some countries in terms of what growth really means um, growth without development is it qualitative or quantitative um, so I would be appreciative if you can basically pinch in that thank you well um the global architecture, all of these uh, organizations that exist around the world, like the, U the UN, the World Bank, or the IMF, uh, they were created for a purpose, many of, many of which have migrated into many other things, like the flavor of the month kind of thing. Uh, and I think they should remain focused on some of the things that they were created for, uh, in terms of fiscal responsibility for the IMF, in terms of uh, alleviating poverty, although that was not the original mission of the World Bank, but it was the reconstruction of Europe after World War II. I think that uh, what has happened with uh, some of these organizations is that they have become, uh, you know, they, they, they have tried to become very politically correct in every sense and try to address each and every issue that exists in a country without believing that there is enough or that there should be uh, local capacity to actually do uh, what is best uh, for the country. So it's a, it's, a, it's a combination where you do want to help, and I think they do play a big role, for example, on what is loosely called global public goods, or when you're talking about avian flu, Ebola, uh, financial crisis, uh, corruption, uh, and in all of these themes that cut across different countries, you do need these organizations to play some kind of role in order to help, uh, if nothing else, bring the parties to the table to make, hopefully, uh, uh, sensible decisions. The problem is that sometimes they tend to, as I said a couple of times, reinvent themselves uh, and, and find a niche where they can continue to justify their existence and not necessarily benefit the countries in terms of the levels of development that countries need. So the short answer to your question is that they should go back to basics. They shouldn't shy away from the fact that uh, you need to do some of the basic things that countries that have succeeded or outperformed others uh, have done, like the many things I have repeated during this morning in terms of opening their economy, fiscal responsibility, uh, minimizing regulation, minimizing the size of the state, cutting, cutting the red tape, all of these things will help more than the resources you provide for building a bridge. Because at the end, that bridge or that road could be built in some sort of public public partnership or purely done by the private sector, again, if the conditions are right. But you have a lot of interest. and I. When I was at the World Bank, I used to encounter this from uh, some of the European countries to try to push for certain kind of uh, legislation or for certain uh, type of public policy that was not necessarily the most convenient for some of the countries, whether it was on social issues or on economic issues. And so uh, aid dependency is bad, uh, and, 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 and it takes two to tango. And, and so countries, some countries, are asking for that aid. Some governments are willing to provide that aid. And by the way, only about 30% of what is usually committed is what is actually delivered. And then you have to see whether that reaches the intended destination. So uh, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but uh, the point I'm trying to suggest here is that A, there is a need for uh, some of these global organizations to exist. There is a play for them to play in certain areas. But I think that there is an overreaching uh, and sometimes uh, excessive 
uh, 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 intru intrusion into what uh, countries should be doing. Again, I mentioned <coughs> before the lack of le leadership. That happens in many of our countries, and so it's very difficult uh, to square that circle. Rob wants to jump it, it in, just, then we're going to have to finish up. Yeah, one, one quick comment about that. I, I actually, I mean, I, this is probably a little bit different perspective than you normally hear, but I actually think that I, these institutions need to exist, the IFC, the IDB, uh, the African Development Bank, I think, to fill space where commercial banks won't go. But they don't always respect properly where commercial banks will go. And they actually uh, are risk averse, where they should be more risk worthy. And second, they crowd out private sector players. And then they impose requirements on countries uh, in order to qualify for a loan, which end up you know, burdening that country with uh, requirements that will otherwise inhibit their growth. So I, I think we need some reforms. Uh, I think we need to be more diligent about private sector capacity and not get into that space and be willing to take a little more risk as a development finance institution. All right. Yep. Thank you. Oh, you would you want, well, real fast. Just, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, just one sorry. quick point to add, which is um, somewhat related to your questions. Um, one of the problems in development is that each of these institutions, bilateral institutions, multilateral institutions, um, essentially pursue their own projects, and you have a lot of people working in parallel um, in the same sectors um, without enough coordination. And especially if you're trying to achieve the systemic change that I was talking about earlier. In other words, not just choose a set of beneficiaries and, and, and create gains for those beneficiaries, but change, help countries change their systems so that they can perform after. Um, a lot more collaboration between institutions like MCC and these multilateral um, institutions on things like policy and institutional reform is really essential. And I think that's also a feature of the compacts that we're working on. We're working in Niger, for example, on a compact um, that is related to uh, better use of water resources for small farmers. World Bank is working in, in exactly the same space. Um, we are very much uh, trying to work with them to, to scale um, and to create more systemic change as opposed to doing our own little water project over here while they do their water project over there. Right. <laughs> Let me just ask uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting the cut it's on. <laughs> but, but, but thanks, everybody. And we have another panel, which will be even more fabulous. Right. Thank you. <laughs>
second. You want to sit down if we can? Where's that commanding voice? Right, exactly. <laughs> this whole court is out of order. Yeah. We'll wait just one second, see if they... Okay, I guess we'll get, um, get started here if we can. Uh, my name is Michael Gerson. I'm a uh, columnist of the Washington Post and a fellow at the One Campaign, which is a bipartisan organization focused on fighting extreme poverty and preventable disease. N not long ago, the uh, founder of that organization, Bono, got into some trouble for saying, quote, aid is just a stopgap. Commerce and entrepreneurial capitalism take more people out of poverty than aid. We need Africa to become an economic powerhouse, end quote. And that's a view now endorsed in goal eight with the target of 7% growth in the least developed countries. It's a UN document that talks of, quote, productive activities, decent job creation, entrepreneurship, creativity, and innovation. So the question at issue in this panel is, and I think we, uh, the previous panel poached on this a little bit, but if rock stars in the United Nations are endorsing rapid economic growth as a prerequisite for economic justice, are American and international institutions ready and willing to make this a centerpiece of their approach? Is it really a market-oriented window dressing or a new way forward? This is not just a matter of public-private partnerships, where the public part, the smaller portion, sets the terms. I think we heard earlier that it's a new way of approaching aid. Poverty does not result from having a dollar a day. Poverty results from being totally disconnected from the institutions that enable enterprise, working schools, health systems, financial systems, the rule of law, and incorporation into the broader flow of trade and capital. And aid at its best will serve these goals. I want to take a point of personal privilege and say I, I've been a strong supporter in government and out of programs such as PEPFAR, PMI, Gavi that are saving millions of lives. And I view the savings of a life as a development achievement. <laughs> a saved life is not merely another mouth to feed. In a system that honors human dignity, human beings are the source of the wealth of nations. So what what, so that is the moral and economic question. How do we encourage systems that honor human dignity? Can't think of a better panel to consider these and other goals. Lee Zak is the director of the U.S. Trade and Development Agency with the defining mission of promoting uh, infrastructure and economic growth in partner countries. Before entering government, Lee was a prominent lawyer and a professor of law. My friend, Ambassador Mark Green, is the president of IRI, former UN ambassador to Tanzania, current board member of MCC, and a four-term congressman, and a part of the House Republican leadership, which in its own way is now a post-conflict fragile state. <laughs> <laughs> and John Norris is the executive director of the Sustainable Security and Peace Building Initiative at the Center for American Progress, he is a prolific and wide-ranging author. He had a fascinating posting, UN posting in Nepal, and he was uh, once at USAID a speechwriter and field disaster expert, which in my experience is often the same job. <laughs> um, so welcome to you all. Uh, let me start by asking one question for each of you to answer as we get started. In your experience, does U.S. development policy adequately embrace private sector growth and economic opportunity as a central focus? And where right now is an area where U.S. policy focus needs to change? Mark, you want to start? So the answer to the first part of the question is no. I don't think it adequately uh, taps into and incorporates the potential of the private sector. And the second part of the question, you know, essentially what 
can we do? I think some of the things laid out by the previous panel, but I would argue that uh, the way that we do assistance needs to be entirely reoriented. First off, the debate public versus private sector is over. Some folks don't realize it. It is over. 90% of capital flows to the developing world are coming from the private sector, so the debate is over whether some folks want to see it or not. So it seems to me the question is, how do we, country by country, where governments are looking for ways to tap into and mobilize their own private sector, how can we be the value add? Uh, you know, so over the years, aid has been about delivering hardware. Uh, these days, we need to be thinking about software. We need to be thinking about the value add that we bring from incentivizing uh, th those policy changes that we believe are key to growth and being of true assistance where those governments are looking to do it. So to me, it's that sort of broad approach that we need to be taking up. Lee, where are we weak and where do we need to be stronger? Well, I think one of the, the institutions already exist. What we need to do is to be able to put more focus on those institutions. I think this is a nice segue from the prior panel. Our agency, the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, as you mentioned, was created for precisely the purpose of encouraging the private sector to participate in economic development, in particular in infrastructure. So there are organizations like USTDA, like OPIC, that are focused on this mission. So I think that from an authorizing point of view, it exists. I think we need to be disruptive with respect to moving the resources to, where, to these organizations today. Resources of money and funding, resources with respect to people, resources with respect to flexibility in how they do business. Um, I agree with Rob um, with respect to the importance of private sector people being involved in government, and then also people in government being involved in the private sector. So I think there are institutions that exist, but I would say that some of the resources are trapped in the wrong places today, and it's going to take a real act of courage, frankly, um, in this environment to be able to move those resources to the right places. I want to explore that more, but John, can you yeah, answer the general question? Sure. Uh, I think two things, both on a micro and macro level. On the macro level, I think we're not very good at development finance. Uh, the mechanisms for development finance are spread all over God's green acre as far as the U.S. government goes. Uh, most other uh, industrialized nations have figured out uh, how to have a centralized development finance bank. Uh, this is a recommendation that uh, lots of smart people around town have made. The President's Global Development Council, of which a member has endorsed. Uh, it's something that actually makes money for the U.S. taxpayer if done properly uh, and can free up and leverage an enormous amount of resources for development. Uh, and hopefully we can find the political sense and courage to figure out how to create a real development finance bank uh, in the next administration, whatever it looks like. Uh, and I think that would be an enormous contribution. Hmm. On the micro level and the kind of person level, I think we need to do a much better job figuring out how we connect individuals to the economic life of their countries. I don't think we've been smart and sharp enough about recognizing those really systemic barriers that keep people out of the economic lives of their countries. And I think things like working on land tenure rights so that women actually have a right to inherit property, uh, making sure that people have a right to a basic legal identity, uh, these are enormously powerful in terms of bringing people online, in terms of their uh, communities, in terms of their economy and the political lives of their nation. You know, and I, and I think we've been very episodic in how we've approached it. Well, two of the panelists talked about courage. I'm just curious, where does that come from? How does it get expressed in our system if we have to make difficult choices to shift resources? I mean, I think it's a combination right now with respect to, um, you know, across the board with respect to the private sector and indicating this is where sh shifts need to be made. It has to come from Congress at the same time to be able to move funding. Um, and in the meantime, it actually has to come within the organizations themselves to say, I'm going to partner with an organization that has the technical talent to get something done. And frankly, I'm going to give them the money to be able to get it done so that we can work together. I have the money. They have the talent. Let's try to shift some of that. So it's basically everybody working together. And it does strike me 
mark as a cause that a Republican could take up, and that Chairman sure. Royce has to some extent. With yeah, no, no, that's true. I mean, first off, I, I would shift the questions. I don't think it's a matter of looking to Washington and say, okay, stop the food fight, take up a different food fight, and get to the right answer. What I would argue is that we should be shifting this decision making as far away from Washington as we possibly can. Instead, we should be going out to the missions all around the world where we have lots of talented professionals who really care passionately about poverty relief and development, and we should be doing a country by country constraints to growth analysis. MCC does it with compact partners. Every country should have a constraints to growth analysis, and we should do it not using economists but using uh, business persons, turning to the private sector, those who are actually interested in this kind of work in the, the investment opportunities, identify those constraints, reach out to our, our country partners and say, hey, look, we will incentivize, we will provide some of the tools to help you break down those barriers. We should also develop a plan to wean every country off of foreign assistance. President Obama has said it, previous presidents have said it, the goal of foreign assistance, I'm not talking about humanitarian foreign assistance, the non-humanitarian, the goal of it should put, be to put itself out of business. We should work to create independence for every country in the world, private sector driven growth. So to me it's not expecting the same parties here to fight more and come up with different answers. Mm -hmm. It's to shift that decision making to where we have eyes on the ground, boots on the ground, smart people who, who really want to make a difference. John, do you have a thought just before we go on to, about that political task, about where this comes from? You know, I think we, uh, it may not be very heroic, but I think we more often than not stumble into courage. Uh, you know, and I think the, if you look at the debate in this town about food aid reform, it's a good one that uh, people always said it was impossible. Uh, there was very little congressional support for it. Uh, kind of every group that had looked at it uh, said it needed to be done. Uh, you know, when you've got AEI, CAP, CSIS, and Brookings all weighing in on the same side of an issue, uh, along with a bunch of humanitarian NGOs, that uh, there is real consensus. Uh, and it got real steam in Congress after having none for a long time, because uh, I think eventually enough people recognized that it was the right thing to do. Uh, and it made sense both uh, from the perspective of a taxpayer as well as uh, actually feeding a lot more people. Uh, I think development finance is a, is a similar issue, that it's got uh, bipartisan support. It makes sense. Uh, and it's just with a lot of patient hard work and educating staffers and members of trying to get over the hump. Lee, we were talking earlier that your point about that there is a serious amount of capital that could be unlocked right now with the right in approaches to investment in infrastructure. So what are, why isn't it being unlocked? What, what are the keys we need to unlock that, that source of capital? Yeah, I think, um, as we were mentioning earlier, and I think Nancy also mentioned, that there's capital available, but what is really needed are bankable projects and prepared in such a way that the private sector can come in and then finance. And so this is an area that does require so grant funding. Um, and it's not an area that has been focused on, frankly, as much in the past because people haven't tried to bring the private sector in the past. So it's one of those shifts that we're talking about as we're trying to bring the private sector. The private sector says, this is what we need, bankable documents. So it's the first time we're hearing this very loudly but the money hasn't been focused on in the past because a lot of this work was being done by direct grant funding or by government funding. Now the shift's coming to private sector, there's this focus on the fact you need to have these things prepared, and the way to have them prepared is through the grant funding. Then the, it's a catalyst to the private sector afterwards. Okay. Uh, John, let me switch topics just a little bit. There's a lot uh, in the SDGs about sustainability, not just economic growth. Um, how do you make the case to the business community, to the private sector, to conservative think tank types, that sustainability is important in these matters? Yeah, I think it's actually a pretty easy case to make. I think the word sustainability is horribly misused and means everything to everybody. Uh, and I don't always love it as a word because sustainability as a concept is pretty binary. You're either sustainable or not. And I, I don't think that's how we operate in the world, that we operate on a curve. 
and I think if we talk about it as efficiency, uh, it, the business case becomes a lot clearer a lot more quickly. Uh, I think food waste and agricultural loss is a, a great example in the SDGs of how this partnership works. You know, we waste around the world uh, about 30% of food that is produced never gets used. 30%, and that's in developed and developing nations alike for uh, very different reasons. Uh, that's an enormous amount of money. That's an enormous amount of food. That's tens of billions of dollars of lost uh, food every year. If you tighten up those systems, uh, the farmers benefit, the middlemen who transport food benefit, consumers benefit, uh, you feed more people, you use less energy, you use less land, you use less fertilizer. Uh, and there's a reason that the U.S. Department of Agriculture is seized with this idea. There's a reason that uh, the big agro companies love it. Uh, and there's a reason that smallholder farmers love it. Uh, because by tightening up this system, we all stand to benefit enormously. And I think that the more we think about efficient production, efficient growth, uh, because that's really what we're talking about, the business case becomes very clear very quickly. And I think that's why we've seen a bunch of big multinationals very excited about parts of this agenda. Mark, it's easy to criticize aid, but we, in the last 10 or 15 years, we have seen something different, right? I mean, we've seen the creation of new institutions, accountable programs like PEPFAR and PMI, um, MCC, as we've been discussing, new international institutions like Gavi and the Global Fund. How, have this, how has this been different from what's in the past, and what are the next steps in that type of reform? Uh, well, it's been different in part because we've incorporated sound business principles in the way that we have done things. We've also listened to our partners, something we didn't do very uh, well in the past. Oftentimes, we'd go to a country and say, look, you're poor, we're here to help. And, you know, and then begin, again, this, this idea of delivering commodities. As we've begun to take a look at what the policy barriers are to achieving uh, certain outcomes and also creating more economic growth, I think you've seen a more inclusive process. And we've, we've got willing partners, and that obviously is the key to getting so much of this done. But I think it's also been the bipartisan consensus. Uh, President Bush did an extraordinarily good job of assembling a bipartisan consensus behind uh, PEPFAR, the, the AIDS initiative, but the Millennium Challenge Corporation. President Obama is to be credited for continuing to build upon that. It's very easy for when the White House switches parties to simply undo or ignore or shove aside what the previous guy did for your own bright, shiny objects. I think the administration should be saluted for what it has done in supporting MCC and PEPFAR and bringing their own initiatives in. So I think there's a lot of progress based upon these lessons learned. To me, the next step is, again, recognizing the private sector capital flows, uh, number one. And, and number two, uh, I think it is going to a model in which we help countries to become independent from assistance in the first place. And it's, it's not just uh, a financial model, it is instead an entirely different approach and outlook when you go country by country. It's to develop a plan uh, and a date certain, and it may be a long ways out in, in the case of a number of countries, and say, okay, we're developing a timeline and a set of steps at the end of which, uh, if we're successful, uh, this country will go uh, from being aid dependent to aid independent uh, so that we go from uh, a country like South Korea, which, which was a basket case at one point and is now one of our top trading partners and a co-investor in assistance. So to me, it's moving towards independence and true partnership. That's what our next steps have to be aiming towards. Liam, interested in your view here as well. I, I know, having been on the other side, the government side, some of this was really ad hoc foreign assistance reform. Okay, we did things in, with presidential initiatives because we couldn't do broader reform. It was very difficult. Um, and we tried to do things differently. And the Obama administration has followed on with Feed the Future, Power Africa, other initiatives. Um, what what change, do you think that things have changed significantly? What have the lessons been of the last 10 years on these? 
I, I do think that there has been a change. I think a couple of them have been mentioned already. I mean, one of them is this focus. I think PEPFAR is a very good example. Um, Power Africa, basically recognizing that you can't be all things to all people. And that by bringing all of the US government institutions together, and I think that's the other important part, it's not one institution, but it's aligning them with all of their different skills um, to be able to achieve a goal. I think that's one of the things that is different and is also very useful. Uh, the other is everything that we're talking about today, um, focusing on the private sector as part of that solution. And one of the things I did want to raise um, is when we talk about private sector, it's not just the US private sector, it's not just the international banks, but basically getting host countries to invest in themselves. Um, Africa is a really good example. There is money in Africa by Africans, and they want to be able to invest, and part of what's different, different is getting them to invest. It's not just donors investing and being able to catalyze that. I, I, just to follow up one second, I, I know that your institution made a decision a few years ago to actually narrow the number of countries that you're, that you're in. Uh, give a, a little indication of what the reasoning was behind that and what, what you've seen. Did you learn that from other successful programs? What was the background? I mean, part of it is we learned it from business. Um, what we do is, it's a lot of what we're talking about here, is that we listen. We listen to our stakeholders. We listen to private sector. We saw what it is that was important to the private sector because they're the catalyst. Um, they're what we're trying to get to amplify. Um, so we went out and we talked, we looked at the indicators that people were talking about earlier, but we sat down with the private sector and said, where do you want to invest? What do you need to do it? And those were the countries we decided to focus on. Mark, uh, in your area, I want you to comment on the relationship between healthy democratic institutions and br the broad-based economic growth that we're talking about here? Well, um, experience shows us that in order for economic development to be sustainable, it has to be uh, married with citizen-centered, citizen-responsive governance. You can't separate the two out. And we had in the, in the previous panel a very interesting discussion about the, the China, China model and I agree with Rob Mossbacher, you've seen with authoritarian or state-managed, state-owned systems, you can mobilize very quickly to achieve some early successes. But in order to make this sustainable over the long run and inclusive, you have to have a system which responds to the needs and the aspirations of their citizens. You can't divorce the two. That's at the heart of the Millennium Challenge Corporation. That's why the indicators uh, for any country in order for them to qualify, they have to invest in their people, they have to rule justly, and they have to invest in uh, markets and a move towards economic freedom because those values cannot be separated out in the long run for the type of poverty relieving economic growth that we're all here to talk about. John, maybe you can talk about the limits of the MCC approach, because there are a lot of countries where poverty will be concentrated in the future that are fragile um, states, post-conflict situations. Those tools seem very, very different and, and difficult, to, and we're seeing how difficult in everywhere from Libya and other places. Um, give me an idea of what, what you see as the limits of the MCC approach and what tools we need beyond that. Yeah, I think obviously the MCC has a bit of a Lake Wobegon effect in that uh, all their students are above average. Uh, and, you know, that's a great portfolio to work with, to be able to make sure that everybody's up to snuff and uh, meets these core indicators and is held to a very uh, strict litmus test. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't line up very well with the challenge of ending extreme poverty right. in our generation. Uh, when we look at, uh, you know, we're already at about half of the population of extreme poverty living in fragile states. Uh, some of those uh, very significant, uh, at least size, middle income countries. Uh, and that portion is only gonna go up, probably up to 70 or 80% as we go forward. Uh, so we need to get much better at figuring out how to deal with fragile states. And we need to figure out how to get much better at institution building and working with institutions. I think from all the research, all the data, uh, if there's a single correlation with successful development, it is 
capable, effective institutions in host countries. Uh, we're not really very good at shaping effective host institutions. Uh, you know, and I think that's one of the, the limitations of uh, development reform by presidential initiative. You know, I, I think PEPFAR, I think Power Africa, Be the Future, they've, the MCC, they've done some great things. But I think they've also continued to constrain the flexibility at a mission level. You know, you've got to count between presidential initiatives and congressional earmarks the dollar that you're getting in an admission is pretty well already divided up, and you have to count it against very specific things. The idea that you've got some flexibility to work with institutions and figure out how you're going to help shape them uh, is very tough. And I think across the board, we have to do a much better job of uh, conflict prevention and working with countries that are four or five years out of a conflict that are showing some promise. We tend to leave them. You know, we've had a successful election, there's been a transition of power, nobody's shooting each other. We tend to get out of those countries pretty quickly. We really need to figure out a way to stay around till about year 10 or year 12 when private sector investment is really picked up. Uh, people are seeing a bigger pie to share uh, economically and politically so they'll stay stable over the long yeah. haul. We tend to get in late and leave early yes. in these conflict situations. We are horrible party guests. Right, exactly. And we're very good at declaring victory. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We're very good at declaring victory. We do that very quickly. Mark, I mean, well, how about this point of institution building? Because I think it's really important sure. to all this. Uh, it, very, very important. Well, first off, uh, something that, that John said that I think is, is really important or, or at least touched upon. Uh, I think we have to have a certain humility in our foreign policy and our development policy. We have this sense that we can fix anything everywhere instead of realizing that we can't want it more than they do. Absolutely. Where we have willing partners, the sky's the limit in what can be achieved. Where we don't have responsive government leaders or those who are yet believers in the types of things that we have to offer in terms of our software of development, you know, you, you, you can help lift lives in the immediate sense, but in the long run, it's not sustainable. It, it cannot last, it cannot succeed. So I think that's a, uh, that's a big piece of it, is, is having this, this humility. In terms of institution building, again, it goes back to this idea of independence. Uh, you know, I'm sometimes asked why it is in countries where we provide a lot of traditional assistance, why don't they like us? You, know, you hear that all the time. <laughs> well, among other things, it is not the natural condition of man to be happy with being dependent upon another country. And if it is, woe to us, that would be a terrible thing. So it is the natural condition of human beings to want to have control over their own future, to want to shape their own future. And so if we should look at reorienting how we do things to recognize that natural inclination. In terms of humanitarian needs and disasters, there are times when the delivery of commodities and such is absolutely desperately needed and on humanitarian grounds we should do it and I think we do and I think we do it pretty well. But in the broader range of development topics, I think sometimes we have to step back and, and recognize that precondition of a willing, interested partner, and then taking a look at how we can enhance their own ability. Final point, there's been a lot of reference to the MCC. A few years ago, I went to do a compact closeout. I'm on the MCC board in an African country, and the government leaders that I met with said that the most important accomplishment of the compact were not the roads. They said, look, China builds roads. Lots of people can build roads. They said because of the way this compact was designed, you have helped us prove to doubters inside the country that you can actually do a project transparently, on time, on budget, in ways that the private sector is incorporated and involved. And that's the magic, that's the secret formula, the secret sauce that I think will help us get to where we all want to be. We're going to go to questions in a second, but Lee, let me just raise trade. You know, mm -hmm. in Africa, we see a lot of countries can't be successful merely as suppliers of natural resources. Okay, they need diverse exports, but it's hard often to compete with Asia um, in, in in these markets. How do we get poor countries better access to developing markets and incorporate this as part of our strategy? 
And I think this is really the mantra, especially coming from Africa, that it's not about aid, it's about trade. And one of the keys um, to trade is being able to build the infrastructure for trade. In, um, in Africa in particular, it's an area where they may have goods, but the cost of transportation makes it prohibitive from them to be competitive with respect to trade. So it is focusing on the infrastructure is one way to help to focusing on building capacity building, as was mentioned earlier today, with respect to having the right rules and regulations, um, so in combination. But I'm just gonna circle back to one thing that Mark mentioned, and when you ask the question, what's different? Um, our agency is known for being innovative, and one of the things that may be different that other agencies don't do, but it goes to Mark's <laughs> point about the fact that our, our voice isn't the only voice or maybe the most persuasive, one of the things that USTDA is doing is once we have worked with a country and trained the country, had done training in a country, we then act as a convener. So for example, we actually did some training with respect to procurement in Botswana. Those procurement officials then went to Ethiopia to do the training. Um, so it's basically learning we're not the only voice, and frankly, we might not be the most persuasive voice. So if we can help facilitate um, that kind of development and capacity building within a country um, by their neighbors may be much more effective than what we can do. We just provide the platform and the initial training. John, do you have any thoughts on institution building than, as it relates to these issues? You know, I think there is a degree to which, um, obviously, if there isn't that core commitment at the country level, it's not going to work. Um, but again, I, I don't think it's quite so binary. I think there's a lot of instances where we've got a handful of reformers in a country, you've got a couple good ministers. Uh, I think we need to be smarter about trying to make it so that we give them leverage in their internal debates uh, and that we structure our assistance not just from the MCC, where it's very clear threshold, uh, but particularly through AID um, and also through our security assistance uh, in ways that we're making clear that we're part of a broader national conversation that is driving towards reform. Because uh, I think a lot of times we deliver assistance and that bigger institutional conversation is fairly divorced from that. Let, let's go to some questions. Must be some hands here. Yeah, please. Um, thank you very much. My name is Kola Fufana. Um, a very quick question. I'm a student of American University. Um, I hear a lot of um, we going into the countries and uh, working with the people on the ground. Um, can you talk or talk about your experiences with cooperation? Because in some of those countries in Africa, they're good private sector, very active, very involved into and in talking about sustainability. Because when you leave the institutions that you help. Um, structural or um, collaborate with will definitely be there. And those are national institutions that will obviously be in those countries. What form of um, two-way level of conversation or um, support that with your experiences have happened in those countries and how um, um, with the aspect of the we factor, instead of it being um, US corporation or private sector institution going into Africa, but it's also the both ways where um, those experiences can be shared or carry on in, in making sure that those sectors are growing because they are going to be the one to inherit um, the country. They're already investing. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I, I think in a lot of ways, US assistance has already been trying to catch up and keep up with the more nimble African companies. I think if you look at the experience with mobile banking on the continent, you know, this was not something that originated in AID headquarters or somebody had a bright idea in Washington. This was uh, African companies and African entrepreneurs with an idea that absolutely lined up with the needs of individuals and priorities on the ground. Uh, and I think more often than not, uh, what we need is assistance that is sensitive to those local corporations and local entrepreneurs uh, and learning from them rather than trying to set the tone and debate uh, and drive them towards some goal that we have here. Uh, so in some instances, I think it's being smart, working with local partners and, and getting out of the way in some cases. I was going to say, this. you may be aware that this summer in Kenya, there was a global entrepreneurship summit 
um, which was absolutely phenomenal, bringing entrepreneurs from all around the world um, and bringing the U.S. government helped bring U.S. businesses to the table as well. So that was an example where I think it was a very big eye-opener um, for the private sector to see the amount of entrepreneurship that was taking place on the continent. And it was a two-day matchmaking event um, where having left, I think there was a great deal that the U.S. businesses learned um, from the entrepreneurship and the rest of the world and vice versa. So that, that's one example of the partnership. And also everything that we do at USTDA, um, we do it in cooperation and with the host country. So it's, it's similar to what Mark had mentioned, that when our project is done, we're leaving learning behind. And we've learned a lot in the process as well. You know, I, there's a real uh, danger for all of us, uh, all of our agencies, and that is that we have meetings here with the private sector or in the capitals or in regional capitals because a lot of the folks that you're talking about can't make it there. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't have the ability or the resources to travel and be part of the discussion. So these are all very important, but I think there is no substitute for a well-trained, capable mission team that uh, U.S. mission team in each country that spends most of its time outside the embassy grounds, mm -hmm. traveling around the country, meeting with small-scale farm farmers, small business persons, reaching out and trying to tap into the natural entrepreneurship that's out there and really trying to build on that as much as you can. But again, I still think the prerequisite to all of this is from the day a program starts is having this sense of it's going to end. And so, you know, we have to have that in sight and make sure by the time we get to that end point, there is a critical mass of local partners who are experienced, trained, have those tools to carry on. Because if we don't, we will have failed, obviously, in our long-term goal of building more partners and, and trying to, you know, decrease the number of of clients, if you will. Who's next? Tony? I think we have a microphone coming here. Up front. Up front. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Tony Fratto with Hamilton Place Strategies. Um, maybe just that sort of two questions, uh, but when, when you talk about we, in, uh, in countries, I mean, no one's a bigger champion than our, of our bilateral programs than, than, uh, than I am. But when I think of we, I think of our uh, cooperation and collaboration with multilateral institutions, especially World Bank Group. So first, just when we, when we think about how long we're in a country, mm -hmm. is there a handoff and how much uh, cooperation are we doing and is that getting uh, better? Um, and, and secondly, um, Maybe and maybe a little bit related. I mean, how how uh, much are our uh, programs thinking? We spend a lot of time thinking about the national level, national programs. Uh, are we getting better thinking regionally? Um, because there are huge opportunities to think regionally, especially in um, uh, infrastructure and greater integration uh, in in regions. Yeah, on the the multilateral question, obviously uh, the bank's a key partner in a lot of this. Uh, but I think, uh, as Mark said, you know, that we show up late and leave early. Uh, there's a lot of things that the bank can't do, in a, particularly in a fragile state. You know, they're not going to wade into the hard-nosed politics of power sharing uh, and how that links to economic growth and structural reforms. And, you know, that's very messy business. Um, and that also goes to a very important point that Mark made of having staff at AID and the State Department that not only get out of the, um, the mission and the embassy, but get out of the capital. Right. Uh, it is increasingly rare for a variety of reasons, including security concerns. You know, I, I worked in Nepal. You know, I've met people from the embassy who said they had never met a Maoist right. in a country that had a 10-year civil war where the Maoists were the major protagonists. Of course, all their housekeepers and drivers were, were Maoists, but they didn't know it. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it was a real liability when it came to actually trying to be involved in the peace process um, because they just didn't know how they behaved. They didn't know they act, how they, uh, how they planned, and there was real wariness on both sides. Um, so I think there are times where, where the bank is really a key partner 
partner, but I think trying to have a deliberate strategy to permanently move more fragile states into a non-fragile category and shrink the pool of countries that slide backwards uh, should really be a cornerstone of our approach at this point. Um, a, a couple of things. In terms of the we, uh, I think more and more you're seeing well-trained chiefs of mission who work with their counterparts to talk about the various tools that are there. So in Dar es Salaam, where I served, I would meet all the time with my counterparts, including not just bilateral missions, but the multilateral institutions. We would take a look at some of the challenges, and I'd say, look, you know, this is something that I have funding for or I'm authorized to do, but I can't do this. If you do this, I'll do that, and we'll move the ball down the field. I think we're getting better and better at that. Um, but you also, Tony, touched upon something that I think is really important and maybe one of the new frontiers for what the U.S. is able to do, and that is to break down some of the regional barriers that stop the creation of markets that have a large enough critical mass to draw the investment. Uh, you know, we, we see too many power lines that stop at the border, too many roads that stop at the border. And so we're starting to see uh, our agencies and our missions beginning to incentivize those policy changes that will create the regional markets. MCC is beginning to take a look at that. Uh, it requires uh, some assistance in terms of its authorities. But it's a great opportunity, I think, for the public sector, which is the natural place for that to reside, incentivizing and providing the technical assistance in ways where relatively small changes in policy can create real opportunities for U.S. private investment, but also ways of enhancing economic growth that will leapfrog over some of the challenges that we're seeing. So it's, I think, an exciting opportunity. And I totally agree with respect to the importance of regional. Um, one of the things USTDA has been involved in are transportation corridors. Um, being, again, being able to sort of be the convener. We were able to convene a group when they were at loggerheads that was focusing on bringing an undersea cable in Africa to be able to bring internet. But the other part about that, and we're fortunate to be collaborating with multilaterals that you, we all normally think of, but USTDA is also collaborating with the regional banks. CAF is a really good example in Latin America where they're doing a lot of private sector lending. Um, and so that's one of the areas where we have an MOU to do things on a more regional basis. It's interesting. I've seen that in PMI, the implementation of PMI. It's a perfect example because you often put, have the bed nets at the center right. and not at the periphery, which leads to serious border problems and requires regional cooperation. So interesting. In the back? Zana Balahi, American University. Uh, thank you. Uh, the panel's been great. I just have a question. Everybody has these great ideas, but what you end up seeing in a lot of countries is that there's so much corruption, so these great ideas never really pan out for the everyday citizen. They just help a few in, in power. Um, what have you guys decided to do about dealing with the corruption? Yeah, I mean, corruption is enormously corrosive in any society. I mean, the, for anybody on the ground in a developing country, the fact that you have to pay off five people when you take a taxi to go pay your electricity bill, you know, is so dispiriting, is so discouraging, and so fundamentally undermines your faith in the state and society and humanity. I mean, it, it just, you know, when it happens to any of us in a very small way, you know, we get outraged. Uh, and we don't think about people who have to deal with it every day and every element of almost everything they do. Uh, you know, I think that there are creative things we can do. Uh, I think we need to put money behind countries that are willing to make reforms. You know, I think uh, Georgia over the last decade has done some interesting things uh, where there is political will to take on some of these issues. I think we have uh, technical assistance that will help improve it. You know, I think the effort to focus on domestic resource mobilization uh, and helping countries figure out how to bring more of their economy uh, out of the shadows and online so that they actually pay taxes and uh, the benefits of those enterprises 
not only flow to the state, but back to the people in terms of social services delivered. You know, that's a big shift. Uh, and I think we'll see that be effective where there is a commitment. You know, I, the AID had a, a very good effort uh, in El Salvador where it was the government of El Salvador that came forward and said, we want to do this. We're willing to put our money on the table. Uh, would you be willing to match it? Would you be willing to help with technical assistance? You know, and I think that if we use a country's willingness to put their own skin in the game uh, as a bellwether for whether we should be doing programs or not, it's a, it's a pretty good barometer. Uh, and I think that will help us invest in countries that are serious about taking on corruption. So uh, with the Millennium Challenge Corporation, 20 indicators, country has to pass half, but there is an unshakable rule. A country that fails the corruption indicator doesn't get a compact, period. It's done. And that and I they think- they will quickly be moved over to AID assistance. That, <laughs> so it is, a, it, is, it is one of the most important principles of the MCC. But let me give you some reasons for optimism on the front of fighting corruption. For, first off, in a small way, at IRI, we are developing uh, initiatives designed to partner with local citizens and activists who want to take on corruption. So we're developing some tools there. But, but secondly, technology is our friend here. The ability of citizens to monitor the public budget, to monitor public works projects. There are some apps that are out there, even some SMS technology that I think are, are very, very promising. On top of that, there are some pioneering figures in this area, Mo Ibrahim and the African Governance Foundation in projects that he has, I think has elevated the discussion so that all across Africa, corruption is being talked about as a serious barrier like never before. So it, it, it may be frustratingly slow, but I think there is a growing recognition, as John put it, corruption is dispiriting, it is a perversion of capitalism, obviously, and it is robbing of everyday citizens, robbing them of their birthright to a brighter future. So it, it may be moving slowly, but I really do think there's a growing recognition that this must be at the heart of, uh, of sort of our policy and approach, but also I think you're seeing it with African leaders, but not just Africa, throughout the developing world. Lee, how are you dealing with these issues? Well, I, I agree with um, both of my colleagues, and you mentioned before about USTDA having 18 countries um, that we focus on. And clearly, it's one of the things that we do look at um, as we're trying to determine the countries we do business in. But I do want to thank um, our colleagues at other agencies like USAID for the technical assistance that they're doing in this area. As a law professor, um, it's no surprise that I really do sort of appreciate, especially working with judicial systems, um, explaining you should pay your judges so they don't get you know, paid in different ways, um, et cetera. So I think a lot of the US government, especially USAID, is doing a great deal in this area. And on the technology side, that is one area where we do have host countries coming to us asking us for e-government systems, ways to be able to manage so that they can ferret out corruption in their systems as well. So we are directly working on the technology side of that. Let's take one or two more questions maybe here. Um, a good part of uh, Mohammed Nimr American University, a good part of uh, USAID or the aid money is uh, military assistance. So my question is how does your uh, vision of uh, a capitalist piece uh, deal with this? How critical are you of uh, Military, military assistance to countries like Egypt and uh, countries USA. that have a lot of coups and all that. Well, just to clarify, yeah. the AID actually doesn't uh, administer any military assistance. Uh, military assistance is uh, a very sizable chunk of the overall uh, foreign assistance budget of the United States. Uh, some of these are administered directly through the Pentagon. Uh, some are Pentagon programs that are administered uh, and overseen by the State Department. You know, I think that there's a lot of reform that needs to be done there. Uh, I think that the State Department has lost a lot of its capability to oversee these programs, uh, that it hasn't been a particularly rewarding track for a Foreign Service officer uh, to raise concerns about 
uh, military assistance or training programs. Uh, it's never great for the State Department to pick fights with the Pentagon because they often lose. Uh, we've seen lots of examples where people who had been through U.S. military training programs went on to run very successful coups uh, afterwards, uh, and lots who have been very good upstanding officers in their own right. Uh, but I think it goes to the point that I was making before. I think we've too often looked at military assistance and development assistance as distinctly different streams. Uh, we haven't looked at them as a coherent package. Uh, we haven't looked at them as what they mean about the overall uh, trajectory that a society is headed on. Uh, you know, and I think Egypt's a great example of both the positive aspects of military assistance, you know, those relationships that were built up between the U.S. military and the Egyptian military uh, helped the Pentagon be able to pick up the phone uh, and have the Egyptian military avoid some of the excesses that they were contemplating uh, during the initial protests against Mubarak and probably saved a lot of lives. Uh, but at the same time, you could say our unwillingness to take on the military's dominant position in society through our overall assistance programs and just to stay confined in health and education and areas that were kind of nice and touchy-feely probably didn't do Egypt any favors uh, for the 40 years that we've been delivering assistance? I, I would say uh, part of the answer, first off, John's exactly right, that we have to look at these as a package and, and how we have our relationship with different countries. But one of the best ways you attack some of these issues is to help build the ability of governments to deliver for their own people. Uh, that's what you see in places like uh, Ukraine. And um, it, this idea that, that these are fragments that we should address separately is a mistake. It's a fallacy. If you can build up the ability of local government leaders to be citizen responsive, you create the kinds of stability and strength in governing institutions that make some of the military assistance um, unnecessary and, and less necessary. And that obviously is in the interests of the citizens of that country, and it's in our interest as well. I think I'm, I'm going to be told when Chairman Royce arrives, um, because we're going to hear from him. But let's just do one or two more questions in the meantime. Here. Hi, Dave Ramoswamy with Africa Agribusiness Magazine. The Special Inspector General's report for Afghan reconstruction said that U.S. projects devoted to improved irrigation, roads, and agricultural assistance transformed half a million acres of land, desert land, into arable land in southwestern Afghanistan. This, unfortunately, is now being used to jumpstart or turbocharge opium production. What possible funding mechanisms can be put in place to be to demonstrate such U.S. technology for Africa. Thank you. I hope you're not suggesting that we export opium production <laughs> yeah. to Africa. 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 Uh, you know, I think reclaimed lands uh, is going to be a very big part of the conversation going forward. Uh, I think that this is another area where uh, the environmental and business community really are finding common cause. Uh, China has just embarked on what is truly a massive effort to reclaim degraded lands in that country, recognizing uh, that this is a, a strategic problem for them uh, to be losing more and more land that is simply unusable. Uh, and obviously, I think this is an enormous challenge uh, across much of Africa. Uh, and I think that uh, we're seeing more focus on how traditional agricultural programs like um, Feed the Future uh, and U.S. leadership in this area can really be combined with sensible areas to not only increase production, but to bring areas that are fallow or have been degraded back online uh, and recognizing that this is really important to help uh, slow uh, migration forced by climate change uh, and to drive economic growth at the same time. Maybe I'll close us up with a, a quote from President Kagame, um, who said, good aid is targeted to create capabilities in people so they are able to live on their own activities, um, which I think is a pretty good definition. 
and I want to thank you all for your insights. Now, it's really my pleasure to introduce one of the real innovators and thought leaders in this space that we've been talking about. Representative Ed Royce is chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He's one of the original authors of Electrify Africa, which is really the right kind of aid, um, right kind of next generation development. Um, and he is the intellectual leader of the GOP on sustainable Republican solutions for development. So, Chairman Royce, welcome. Well, thank you all, and uh, thank you to AEI and Consensus for Development Reform for your important work. And uh, the thing I, I like best about AEI is the idea that ideas matter. They have consequences. And you're always in this, uh, in this role of putting ideas up front and center. And I think uh, Consensus for Development Reform uh, has shown the same uh, aptitude. I think it's, uh, there are a lot of lessons over time which classical liberals and uh, conservatives learned about economics. And I, I do think we are in danger of not taking advantage of that foundation of economic thought when it comes to development. And one of the, uh, one of the consequences, I think, of ideologically bound uh, uh, thought on the, on the hard left and maybe the, some of the new populism on the right is that there isn't an appreciation for the role of ideas and the way to drive those ideas through consensus. And uh, so I, I uh, really want to express my appreciation. I think um, we owe, we owe um, Arthur Brooks um, uh, some acknowledgment for conservative heart. I uh, hope, uh, hope uh, some of the members I see on the Hill open that book. Uh, and uh, uh, take those, those messages to heart because I think we have, uh, in this field of ideas, a way to put a lot of uh, additional concepts in the pipeline. And I thought I'd, I'd talk about some of the thoughts that I have, having been involved uh, for many years now as the former chairman of the Africa Subcommittee and one of the co-authors of the African Growth and Opportunity Act in trying to put a focus on moving uh, sub-Saharan Africa to engagement in trade and do so by liberalizing markets here, uh, opening markets here in the United States, but on the condition that there are reforms in those economies that recognize uh, basic foundations that have worked very well in setting uh, for the uh, for the West um, um, the prerequisites prerequisites for economic success. Uh, how many here have, have read uh, uh, the the work uh, the mystery of capital? Why it works in the West and fails every everywhere else? You see a show of hands. Well, Denny did. I know that. And your your twelve year old daughter read that book, right? Yeah. What? What? Tell, tell that story very quickly, if you will, Denny. I think it's a great story. I thought that was very, very encouraging, though. <laughs> she plotted all the way through, and I'd like you all to plot all the way through. And the reason I want you to focus on issues like that is because what we forget is what Arthur Brooks is trying to tell us, which is that free markets and free trade and property rights and the rule of law have lifted billions of people out of poverty. It has saved the lives of billions of souls on this planet. And it is very important that our colleagues on both sides of the aisle understand the role that that played. And as we look at trade with uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, 
which has doubled. As we look at the number of countries that have opted to take that deal and accept the concept that they're going to stand up an independent court system and they're going to uh, engage in moving towards a system founded or, or that, that's foundation is on rule of law, we see the consequences of that. Myself and Mark Green, who was the former ambassador to Tanzania, traveled uh, when he was in Congress here. I know Porter Delaney is, is only too aware of the consequences of engagement by the United States and leadership by the United States, and in this case by Europe too, because their initiative of, of uh, everything but guns, as I recall, uh, was the name of their uh, tariff engagement of lifting that and opening up their markets. Uh, but the, the, the concept that Louis, we could precondition this on the adoption of the policies that have worked for countries internationally and for societies around the world has had very positive benefits. I've been in most of the countries in Africa now, and I've seen the results of this, and I've seen especially the results for women in, in the liberalizing impact that this has had in their societies. And um, so I think that legislation to break down barriers to trade and barriers to entry and establish rules of law uh, have led to the empowerment of many around the globe. Uh, on Millennium Challenge Corporation, Mark Green was uh, on the ground uh, from the beginning, very beginning with that. And we saw that built from the ground up. And um, you know, I, I recently was in the Philippines where we were trying to establish the rule of law there with respect to property registers, registries and, and title. And we've got a long way to go. And that place is so corrupt so corrupt, it's endemic, this is part of the legacy of Marcos. But if they're going to have a chance, a new start, it has to come with getting the fundamentals right so that people can actually have some security to build on their own property or to borrow or to know who owns the land and not have it taken out from under them. And um, so now we're beginning to see these countries change their laws, right? We're seeing heads of state across Africa and in the developing world uh, say, okay, we are, going to, we are going to now recognize those principles. We've seen civil society drive a lot of this. Civil society was the great partner with, with Goa uh, in Africa. It was that element of the society that was really pushing for the reforms. And so the things that we take for granted, like a, uh, a, a system to title for property, don't exist in many of these countries. And civil society needs a partner, it needs leadership, it needs the United States, and it needs members on both sides of the aisle to understand how important this is. Um, a big part of our development goes to emergency relief. And many of you are already aware of this debate, this argument, I won't belabor it. But for many years now, we've been trying uh, to push this as part of our reform agenda. And I was uh, in Tacloban after the um, devastation there of uh, that uh, hurricane. And I can, I can just share with you, I, I was in one village where there was only one home that was left standing. But if they had had to wait for six weeks for grain to arrive or the, on a U.S. flagged vessel, instead of USAID AID having the capability in real time to buy that grain from farmers there in Tacloban, uh, I guarantee you thousands would have starved, if not more. Uh, the reforms that we made to get that temporary relief through saved lives. And we've seen the consequences of, you know, systems designed in the 1950s. In, in, in 2008, we, I know that uh, Mark's only too aware of the famine in Kenya and the, 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 the tragedies there. Truckloads of U.S. food being delivered. And part of the calculus was not understanding that in other parts of Kenya, you had uh, farmers, subsistence farmers, who were growing grain that could have been transported there in, in real time. What happened in 08 was we dumped that grain on the market too late, but we dumped it in such quantities, in such a way as to deprive, as to, as to put those farmers out of business and expand, expand the crisis and the poverty in other parts of Kenya. These 
this has to be thought through. We have to consider the impact on markets. We must figure out a way to aid those in crisis after a typhoon or, or a, or a earthquake, without, without damaging those locally, and we have ways now to do that. Um, and local purchases of food from local producers avoids that devastating consequence and ensures that once the crisis is over, the local market is still there, it's still functioning. In terms of uh, Electrify Africa, this encourages public-private partnerships to increase power production and access to power in rural and urban areas across the subcontinent. How can you run a business if you've got to have a backup generator? Uh, I've been in uh, Liberia to see uh, even our own embassy there. I remember the quoted costs of running that generator on backup, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a month. Now, there is no way that a entrepreneur is going to go into uh, business in an area where you don't have uninterrupted power. But the consequences uh, are far greater than just what it means in terms of the ability to stand up a business or invest locally. It, it also impacts the hospitals. It impacts the schools. It impacts the students uh, going home to study by kerosene lamp or car charcoal and all of the problems with their eye condition, conditions that are going to result. So the United States uh, under Electrify Africa has the capability here to play a major role in bringing the grid uh, across, uh, across Africa and, and other forms of power. And um, we've now seen movement in the Senate on this legislation uh, through the Foreign Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I passed it out last Congress into the Senate and wasn't able to, uh, to get it up and out. But uh, at this point, uh, we're encouraged. Uh, international food aid refor reform I talked about, but um, uh, we're working right now to try to negotiate uh, those reforms on a permanent basis uh, that we've sort of made ad hoc um, over time. Our uh, Global Anti-Poaching Act <clears throat> would help Africans push back against the international criminal networks that that operate there, and for those who push back and say, well, this is not the role of uh, the U.S. military to give advice, so think about who the, who the beneficiaries are right now of the poaching efforts. The primary beneficiary is al-Shabaab, which uh, is in the business of taking ivory, whether it's uh, rhino horn or you know, tusk from elephant. Uh, we're, we're precariously close to seeing uh, the end of the forest elephant, the black rhino, the extinction of whole species. And in the meantime, there's a vibrant market among uh, radical Islamist groups that then transport this, whether it be Boko Haram or Al-Shabaab or two other radical Islamist groups also operating. They take that to the ports in Kenya and they, or Somalia, really, and they uh, transport it to Asia, to criminal gangs in Asia. So we've got a two-pronged effort here, and part of it is uh, uh, cooperating internationally to bring more pressure on the uh, demand side. But there's a lot we can do uh, that will bring our resources into play by sharing information in terms of the treks made by El-Shabaab and, and, and Boko Haram in the ivory trade and using our spy satellites, using our agents on the ground, using our capabilities in special ops, and turn this information over. We don't want El Shabaab to grow arithmetically because it's found a way to get its hands on uh, additional resources like this because it, it comes back home here. It'll hit us in Minnesota, you know? I mean, you look at the nexus today of uh, radical networks uh, that occasionally recruit out of the United States and then figure out the consequences in terms of them getting their hands on these resources. It is the only thing that has supported the Lord's Resistance Army 
uh, all these years is this trade in ivory. Otherwise, they would have imploded. They're trading it right now for ammunition in order to hold on. So the United States can play a pivotal role with this anti-poaching legislation. And it, when we talk about how Africans can have a thriving ecotourism uh, industry that can support lo a large percentage of the population, that's not going to happen with our, our, without our engagement to protect these species and end, uh, and end uh, th this, this terrorism that preys upon it. Women are key to development, and they're the, the backbone of healthy societies. They are the breadwinners, they're the caregivers, they're the educators, they're the peacemakers, and in too many quarters of, the, of this world, of this globe, women are denied the opportunity to go to school or to participate in the economy, or to be represented in the voting booth. And, and uh, they do not enjoy equal protection under the law. So one of the pieces of legislation that we've passed, the, the Girls Count Act, uh, attempts to address this, this disenfranchisement of the females of, of the species. And, um, you cannot have nations thrive when half of their population are denied the most basic human rights. So the Girl, Girls Count Act is to force these other governments around the world to have birth registration for girls so that they can go to school, so that they will have rights, property rights for girls under their laws, changing their legislation in, in developing countries and it's never underestimate the influence that we can have in the United States, as Denny would tell you. Never underestimate the influence we can have when we pass legislation uh, and, and that impacts and puts pressure and leverages overseas the actions of governments there. Now, last month, 17 Sustainable Development Goals were adopted at the United Nations. And it's an amb ambitious agenda to eliminate extreme poverty. And you've been talking about those goals all morning, so I, I won't go into that. But what I can say is this. Achieving that goal cannot ha happen absent what we've been talking about here, which is market-based economic growth. Growth cannot be reached in countries that do not embrace good governance through political and economic reforms. When we had our meeting here in Washington with representatives of um, a number of states, um, and they asked me to speak after listening to the presentations, the one thing that stood out most to me was the absence of good governance as a criteria by the states that are most in need of reform. And we fail to place governance at the center of the development agenda. And I'd like you all to consider what the consequences of that have been and will continue to be in many of these dysfunctional states. In fact, the word governance is not even mentioned. And I think as we, as we move on, simply plain Spain's lip service to rule of law will not create the conditions for growth that are absolutely essential if we're going to eliminate extreme poverty. This failure undermines every aspect of the rest of what we seek to achieve, including efforts to support the economic and, so and social empowerment of women and to enhance the role of the private sector in development. Good governance was left off that agenda, and I'd like to ask you why you think they left it off. Um, I think it was to appease the countries that need it the most, and I think that's the big elephant in the room. At the same time, we all know that the UN is bad at working with the private sector. It shuns competition. It shuns transparency in its own operations. I can tell you that from multiple trips up there and many discussions I've had with our ambassadors to the UN who all explain the same frustration. How can it be a credible advocate for policies that create an enabling environment for the private sector 
when the attitudes internally are what they are. So these concerns, the UN approach to development, that only reinforces the need for what? American leadership in this. Together, we can keep governance and economic policies that we know generate growth at the center of this debate, at the center of the development agenda that we're pushing. And slowly, we're making progress. Each step of the way, we've benefited from the insights and support of AEI and the consensus for development reform. And lastly, this is truly a long game. As long as we stick to the principles and understand that you can't ex expand access to food and water and power without opening trade and protecting property and promoting good governance, we will get to the end of that road. And I thank you again for the work and the interest of all of you in this room uh, on this debate. Thank you so much. Any, any thoughts or qu questions? I'll take a couple if, if there's anything in particular you think the col my colleagues and I on the committee should be contemplating or um, any questions you have. Thank you again. <laughs>